Are you what I no, yours looks very different to ours. I tell you what, actually, outside the uh, news building here, the sun is a f is sort of shining on the Canary Wharf, and in uh. the background is a full moon. And it looks oh, fantastic. Oh, it looks lovely. And you're not going to see any of, it. any of that. <laughs> Mark Sager's coming up. Uh, for me, I will see you next weekend, of course, Saturday and Sunday. In the meantime, have an absolutely fantastic week. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, you've been a fantastic audience as ever. Uh, have a great week. Bye from me. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Got a great show for you tonight. In the middle hour, we have Rick Parry, the EFL uh, top man, with us alongside Gavin McGaw and Andrew Mills. And also Mark Palios, who knows what it's like to be an executive at the high end of football, but also co-owner and chairman of Tranmere Rovers. We get into that full-on debate in the middle hour of the show tonight from 8 o'clock. As it's an international... Uh, week and weekend and then half of next week too. We not only feature England obviously against Brazil last night and what they might do against Belgium coming up on Wednesday, but we're with Colchester and Mansfield and Northampton and Derby because it's the real fans that do really matter to the Sunday night club. Uh, it was uh, in the early hours of uh, the morning, of course, uh, our time that the Grand Prix in Australia was won by Ferrari. We'll be talking more about that in the last hour. We'll have a good look at the tennis still to come. It's the Miami Open at the moment. And just after nine o'clock, Hackett and Halsey, our uh, two referees. Just one other thing I want to say before I join John Salarco to look uh, at England's uh, first defeat since the World Cup, losing 1-0 uh, at against uh, Brazil is Sven Joran Eriksson. When he was England's manager, he never swerved or ducked anything. He did every interview you ever asked of him, whether it was win or lose or he was under pressure or whatever. He was just a really decent bloke. He had quite a mixed life as well and a wonderful one. He enjoyed himself and why not? There was Nancy Delalio, but he just loved talking to the women. And then on one occasion, he found out that Todd Grip, who was his big assistant, um, who uh, just wondered about one or two things of, that they were doing at the time, and there was a, quite a big story breaking, and Todd Grip suddenly left training, and I decided to follow him. Well, he jumped on a double-decker bus, and so did I. And in the end, uh, he got off uh, in Soho Square, and uh, I sort of uh, got off there as well and uh, went up to him and said, is this a footballing matter? And he said, it's something that you don't need to know anything about. And uh, next time I saw Sven, he just went to me, he said, ah, oh, Mark, the man that followed Tord for nothing. Unlike me when I follow the women. He was a great man as England manager, and it was an absolute delight to see him smiling now, of course, terminally ill with cancer. When last night, with his England captain uh, by his side in Steven Gerrard, he managed Liverpool in front of 60,000, and he smiled from start to finish. Good on you, Sven. And just showing a really good side of football. And to be fair to Jurgen Klopp and everybody at Liverpool Football Club. Brilliantly well done. It's something I know that he'll never, ever forget. John Salako, good evening to you. Evening, Mark. Oh. It's, it's so sad to hear about Sven and, you know, it really, really breaks your heart. But I want to send out a real big love and uh, out to Kate, Princess of Wales. Obviously, she's going through it and uh, I wish her a speedy recovery. Just love her and uh, wish her well. And obviously the king as well. You see, it, it touches too many people, unfortunately. Touch of class there from you, John. And uh, we would all agree with that. That was... I thought it was a breath of fresh air, actually, even before we knew about that, when she posted that photograph of her and her family. We all edit our photographs, don't we? It didn't matter to me. It just showed that she understood us and we, or most of us, who just want to understand her and, and uh, her husband, of course, uh, who's uh, a big Aston Villa fan and yeah. um, a, a great oh. football man. Yeah, Mark, you live in that world and, and unfortunately we all do. Um, I'm sorry, we do. And... <laughs> The, the the circus that's followed it and, and everything that's going on is yeah. just disgraceful and I hope they leave her alone and just let her yeah. go through treatment and start you know it's just really nuts uh, that yeah. um you know there was obviously something there that needed to come out at the right time so yeah and she was yeah. brilliant with what she said she wrote every word and spoke every word absolutely mm. perfectly well England Brazil there's always a way that England find that 
Brazil will manage to get the better of them, whatever happens. Yeah. It was with a young man called Endrick last night. This was, I mean, this was sort of one or two of the, the, the players really playing for places, though, for England. First of all, your overall impression of, of that game? You know, I thought, I thought we did OK. Um, and again, I, it's, it is a little bit disappointing. You feel we've we've moved on from there. And as you just said, it was an opportunity for some of the other guys to come in mm. and state their cases, really to go to the Euros and show that they're ready to step up. Ollie Watkins being one, Bel Ben Chilwell being the other one, uh, Conor Gallagher, which I thought those three were, mm. weren't, you know, didn't really do themselves too many favours. I mean, Conor's incredible. His energy is a great lad. You know, he sets the tempo. But what I love about the Brazilians is that we forget that, you know, they know the game. They're, they're, you know, their footballing intelligence is fantastic. When you look at Guimaraes, Gomez and Pacatau in midfield, they're all talented midfield players who go forward, but they were so disciplined and so rigid with what they did. They were very aggressive. They shut us down, got on our faces. How Pacatau didn't get booked earlier, how he didn't get a second yellow card. He's by the by. I mean, Mr. Diaz is Portuguese, the referee, and mm -hmm. it was a little bit weird, but he, I, I loved his old school refereeing and he let things go and he, you know, he sort of refereed it both ways, mm -hmm. but Bakatar was on that line for a long time. But let's mm -hmm. not look at that. I mean, it was just silly little mistakes, naivety, as I say. We lost Carl Walker early on, which wasn't great. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at that first chance that, that they have, you know, sort of Bakatar slips Connor Gallagher. You can't let that scrimmage steps into the space. You know, when you drift into the old ones, then he's looking forward and then Vinish Jr. is just world class and he makes that run and Walker can't deal with it. Maguire and Stones aren't ready for it. And it's just the finish wasn't there. And and again, you know, it, they tested us all evening. They soaked up pressure. They let us come on. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of positives there for Gareth. You know, I, I think we needed a bit more creativity in midfield. Mm -hmm. We needed a bit more creativity on set pieces. We had lots of corners, lots of free kicks. And it was the same old, they they had a zonal marking, which I thought we could have exploited, moving the ball a little bit. So it's, there's lots of little things that we need to work on that you wish were there, but ultimately they were just too good for us and they were the better side. I, yeah. You know, but we, we did okay. And there, there was a lot of positives there for me in, in the way we played. The difficulty always is for uh, the, the, the sparsity of the number of games that you actually play, but also the opportunities of those on the fringes of things get and how much yeah. that consumes them. I think that is a very different mindset to the Brazilians. who they've, they, they've never been afraid to put their foot in. They've never been afraid to show an extra bit of quality. They've never been afraid if it's their first, second, third or 50th game. They sort of know from the start they're ready made for the international scene, whereas we don't seem to be. Mark, it's like religion to them. It's a second. They they live and breathe it. Mm. It's everything to them. Every, you know, where they come from in the favelas, on the beaches, and the way they play the futsal. And, you know, it's just a love and it's a dance. It's, a, it's an expression of what they do. But what I loved about them yesterday, they'd lost three games, drawn one, no winning five. You know, the new manager comes in and... You know, he 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 expects he's an old wily manager, experienced, and he set them up. But one thing they did, they came out with energy, they came out with aggression, and you have to earn the right to win the game. And that's you know, I just love the fact that they brought that and they understand the level and all those people at home watching them playing. It means so much to them, and it and it means so much to the players going out there. And I'm not quite sure we quite replicate that and. You know, although Gareth has brought uh, the pride back into the shirt and the love and, and, and the lads genuinely do, do want to play and do understand, you know, how important and, and how special it is to play for England and pull those shirts on. Um, you collars know, it, up or collars down? What would you have had if you were playing? Oh, collars up. I mean, what are we doing? Come on. The, 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 you know, we can't mess with the St George's Cross. No, I don't, you know, it's just, yeah. it's a no. It's just, no, no. Where, where are we going? You know, it's just... It's going crazy. Well, two, two things quickly about that. One, that exactly what you said there. I mean, it, I've I've followed England right since the uh, 80s uh, professionally, uh, working oh. there. And I mean, the the red the cross of St George's is, is is the flag. The Union flag is for the all the nations at, at times yeah. and for our Olympics and uh, what have you. But it, the cross of St George. So not just that. It's 125 pounds for that special England. Are they having a laugh, the FA? It is bad. 
I mean, it, yeah, it is, it is disgraceful. That is way too much. I mean, we they, they don't need to do it as well. So it's just no. really punishing the fans yeah. or because they, they know they want it. They want scarves and they want the shirt and, you know, they're not, they know they're going to buy them. So it, it's really not, not on. So it does need addressing, I have to yeah. say. What about uh, Belgium to come then midweek? What does uh, Gareth Southgate do this time around? Yeah, do you know what? I really like the lad Maynou. I, you know, you know Gareth. You know, bless him. I, and I know he wants to. You know, he's got so much loyalty for the players. And he, he you know, he, you know, I thought at half time we could have brought Maynou on. I think Madison. I really like and the options of Ivan Tony and and giving some of the lads a rest. And you say they're playing a lot of games. Give him a chance. So I, I expect him to freshen it up. Yeah. Um, in there and the one big thing I would say to Gareth and you know love him to bits is just you know I think we need that little bit of expression that little bit of character that little bit of letting the handbrake off a little bit and enjoying ourselves if we've got to bring Foden as an eight um, you know just try something different uh, something a little bit more out of the box and play you know maybe Foden in that eight and Rashford out wide but just try a little bit of exper ex experimentation rather than, you know, we seem to be just a little bit too predictable. Well, and and that has been the problem, hasn't it, all the way through everything, that even when we've had a lead, as we did against Italy, obviously, yeah. uh, in that final and everything, rather than go on and try and finish them, they were on the ropes at that stage. No, again, we go defensively on this. And I have to say that under real pressure, we are likely to concede still. It's just the way of it. So I just think, you know, have a go. Try and finish these sides off if you can. And that if they get back into it, you, you're only back where you started. Exactly. We've just got to understand and read those situations defensively. We've got to mm. have that caution. But exactly, I think we've, you know, we've got to box, uh, box things in and better on the edge of the box, and especially on set pieces. And these guys with the pace and the power, you know, Belgium are not, you know, they had wonderful superstars everywhere. They're not the team they were, but they've still got, you know, your De Bruyne's, your Lukaku's, you know, they've still got a lot of lot of good players and they're, they're a top, top team. And, and these are the kind of teams that we struggle against. We do beat the teams that we should beat, unfortunately. You know, a multi yeah. two, you know, with, you know, massive North Macedonia way, you know, one, one, it, you know, it's like, okay. But we do need to start beating the big teams and it will be great to get mm. a result against Belgium a positive result and because they are a top side and and that will just give us confidence and then we've got two more yeah. warm-up games before we go into the tournament itself but again we've just got to go and believe in ourselves we've got the players um and as you were saying and I I definitely think just the one thing is Gareth's just got to let the brakes off I don't know whether he's made the decision or not that if he doesn't get to the final and win this tournament, whether he's going to, you know, move on. Um, I've just got an inkling he has. I mean, I know that the press have got hold of this Man United story. How wonderful would it be um, for Gareth to go and manage a big club or one of the biggest clubs in the world like Man United? Because mm. you've only got five. I'm not five sure in. they want a manager who's going to put the handbrake on, though. Well, this is what, you know, I think Gareth goes into this tournament and, um, you know, he just gives it a real go. I think he's just been so incredible. And he's, he, you know, he's, he's, you know, his status can't be any higher um, at the moment. If he's going to get a big club um, after this, this is the time to do it. Go out with a flurry, at least playing great football. I mean, if we go and win it, obviously, I, I assume he stays. But, um, you know, whichever way he does it, I think that's the one question mark about Gareth is that 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 tactical acumen and that, you know, that real... Mm -hmm you know, identity and character and, and really being able to personality on games and being able to change them and, and affect players like that. Just a word about Wales. Oh, incredible. Fantastic. Incredible. Poland, you know, it's it's, it's brilliant. Uh, this would be, the, I think, their third tournament in a row, which is just incredible. I mean, we'd love to see, obviously, we want Scotland to be there, Wales to be there, mm -hmm. and obviously the Irish teams as well. But um, they seems to be under Rob Page, a real you know, uh, you know, real unity, real confidence. There's a lot of young players. And as he said, you know, there's a lot of young uh, Welsh players playing in the top leagues and, le you know, in the championship mm -hmm. and in, in the Premier League, which is great. Um, and we do need more, you know, the, in, you know, in the Premier League, it's only 30% are, you know, are English, um, probably only 40% are British and, and probably the championship is getting too much like that. So it is great um, to have the home nations there. And we wish, you know, the Welsh all the best. Um, mm -hmm. For the Polish game, yeah, no, it, exactly that. It is a with, with all of these things. This tournament will be, be upon us before we know about it. And as you've mentioned, there we've got this game Wednesday, and there's a couple more to come, and then there are probably a little bits and pieces behind closed doors. It's not a lot, you know. I always would like to see him now 
uh, injuries permitting, really start those last two games with the side he wants to start the tournament with. And the rest yeah. of them just have to put up with that. Well, exactly. You've got to make tough decisions. Um, I think he's a, he's a little bit too loyal at times and just shake things up and put, you know, put the players that are in form, the ones that are performing in. But obviously Kane wasn't there, Saka wasn't there. And there was a there was a few injuries, but you know, Bellingham obviously got the cramp, but I mean Bellingham's sensational. Yeah. If only we two or three Bellinghams in. <laughs> It'd be awesome, but we have got the talent, and it's about you know using that talent to the best of its ability. And I think it's just letting them off and, and, and maybe just mixing up the way we play a little bit so that it's a bit harder for the opposition. But it's that quality in the last third, it, you know, that really let us down. I think at times, mm. just especially Chilwell down the left, and you know, Ollie Watkins had that chance, but Bruno, I think, gets across and hits it onto his foot, so you can't be blamed for that. But that was his only chance, you know, Maguire had a header. Um, you know, I think Anthony Gordon had a, had a chance at the far post that he could have done better. It was just it was just that little bit of quality in around the box, that little bit of guile and creativity and that invention that we need. Maybe an Eze, as I said, I, like, I like, really like Madison. So we, we've got a lot of talented players there, creative players that, that can make things happen. Um, so we've got to eat at one. We've got to make sure we have. that we... We, we shut the shop up and then going forward, we just got to have that creativity yeah. and invention that can unlock the door. Play with a bit of freedom and uh, who yeah. knows. Great stuff as always, John. Lovely to have you on the show. That's John Salako. Perfect kickoff for us here tonight on the Sunday Night Club. We, uh, with, of course, no Premier League or Championship, some First Division games not on as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the lower leagues, uh, Leagues 1 and 2 tonight. And why not? Northampton Town with a great win over Derby County will keep your um well we'll find out exactly how both those sides are going and we're also in uh with the other boys mansfield and colchester in league two all of that to come in the first hour before a special hour tonight on the new football regulator and exactly what that's going to mean rick parry amongst our top guests with mark palios and others after eight o'clock tonight <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was supposed to have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good evening to you. Welcome to the Sunday Night Club. Uh, good to have you with us uh, at uh, Talk TV, still at the moment, for a while anyway, and at Mark Saggers if you've got anything you want to say to us. And you can also uh, go to uh, Talk and, um, oh, w w well, you can call us if you want to, but we're not going to be taking any calls tonight, really, So uh, because we're, we're, we've got some terrific guests to come. But uh, you can get involved uh, as I've mentioned, uh, on X is probably the best way uh, to um, decide what you think you're hearing or seeing and liking or not, as the case may be. Well, with uh, the international football going on, time for us to take a good look at uh, Leagues 1 and 2 tonight. We're going to start with uh, yesterday's game uh, between Northampton Town and Derby County. Derby's second at Portsmouth at the moment in League 1 and going really well. Northampton Town uh, more than mid-table and... Um, uh, punching above their weight as far as they're concerned for parts of this season. They've done really well. They they thought early on in the season it might not uh, happen for them this year, but uh, they have uh, really done well in a 1-0 win yesterday. So Charles Collins is all cobblers to me and uh, their podcast. And Nigel Owen, black and white together, uh, is uh, also with us with Derby County tonight. Uh, gentlemen, a very good evening to you. Nigel, it's uh, good to uh, see you again. And um, welcome to the show as well, Charles. And uh, really, you, you know, Northampton Town, you've had a good season. Yeah, it's been a fantastic season, to be fair. We didn't think that it was going to be... Uh, I, I almost said as easy as this. It's not been <laughs> easy, but it's been a lot better than what I think anybody predicted us to do. I think... Literally at the start, before a ball had been kicked, there was only one set of pundits who had us finishing above the relegation zone. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to the Not The Top 20 podcast. Everybody else had us going down easily. Uh, and, you know, we've proved them all wrong, which is delightful from our perspective. Well, I've seen you twice, actually, this season. Uh, the first game against Cambridge United at your place and then the second game the other week. Uh, back at ours, and uh, I, I really like the resilience of this Northampton Town side. Yeah, I, we're not a, a kind of side that will give up too easily. We tend to go right to the end, and we score some pretty late goals over the course of this season, which has been really pleasing to see. I, I think for me, the best part has been the slight change in playing style. We, most people, remember the last time we were in League One, it was during that lockdown season where we couldn't go and mm. Keith Curl was in charge and, and we basically just played lump it as high and as far as we could and, and we went down pretty easily. Um, we're not doing that this time at all. We like to get the ball down and play it. It's not always uh, entertaining every single time watching the ball just get played between the back three or back four. But th the fact that we're trying to play football, as some people would say, uh, it is is a nice change for us, and and the fact that we've had some terrific results this mm. season, yesterday included, uh, has been you know testament to the way that John Brady has has set about this season. It's it's been fabulous. Yeah, it's what you're doing really well. Of course, Derby County themselves are doing well. Uh, be disappointed, Nigel, really, with Portsmouth not involved, not to have got a little closer to them this weekend. Yeah, definitely. Evening, Mark. Um, yeah, it, it was a little bit sort of, um, yeah, last week was a great win, a great win over Bolton that mm. put a little bit of breathing space between us and them. Um, and then yesterday felt a little bit like in a tennis match when you, you get a break of serve and then you've got to make sure you win your own serve to consolidate that. We didn't do that yesterday. It's still in our hands with six games to go. I think any team would take that if, at this stage of the season. Um, but yeah, we've just made it 
a little bit trickier than it needed to be. Um, yeah, no disrespect to Northampton. You know, they, they played well yesterday. Um, we didn't get to grips with, with their style. Um, they scored early on and then made it difficult for us and we couldn't find a way to, to break it down. We could plead injuries, we can plead whatever, but at the end of the day, you know, fair credit to Northampton yesterday. They were good value for their three points. Mm. Uh, I mean, Derby, Derby County themselves, a side that uh, we know have got something about them. We know that the championship is something that you need as a club. It's a club that we've followed on this show ever since the Sunday night club started, really, with one or two of the problems in the past and everything. But um, are you settled much more now? I think certainly off the pitch, um, you know, the the settled state of the, the, the finances, um, the fact that David Klaus has come in and has calmed the club down, um, you know, it's good that we've got an owner that we don't hear from very often. Um, you know, there, there, there are there are owners out there who like to talk a lot. There are owners who don't. And Davey's definitely in that that group who don't like to talk. He just gets on with it. Um, he clearly is a, a lifelong fan of the club, wants to see the club back to the championship at, at least. Um, and has gone about it in a sensible way. He hasn't walked in and thrown millions around, um, as previous owners have tried to do. Um, you know, he's supported Paul Warren in, in ways that he can do. Uh, Paul Warren is experienced in getting clubs out of this this division. Um, it's not been easy this season. It still won't be easy for these last... I'm hoping it's only six games and it doesn't go to, to eight or nine games. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, the problem that, that we're having, that I think all clubs are having when I look at across the, 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 the divisions, actually, not just this one, is the amount of injuries that clubs are having to key players at key times there seem to be more this season than ever before i don't know what it is but you know we're we're going through strikers at a rate of knots you know there's almost sort of one going down every other week we've had james collins out for the last few weeks we managed to sign dwight gale who's then pulled up with a hamstring injury last week uh, we had tyrese john jaws on loan from arsenal who just as it looked like we were starting to see the best of him his hamstring went in, in a severe way meant that, that he's you know, almost been out connor washington came back yesterday after several weeks out we'll have a great strike force for the last game of the season yeah. what we're hoping is that um you know we, you, we don't need them uh, for those extra games at the end yeah you make you make a good point there and uh, a, a shameless plug for a, a book actually that i've written with uh, a former the former northampton town uh, doc uh, who's uh, done an awful lot of uh, orthopedic surgery on a lot of footballers uh, we've written a a book about, it's called A Plague in All Our Sports. It's about world sport and COVID and what happened during those years, not in just diary form, but also talking to a lot of people. And the medical profession are not surprised because of the relentless activities and the stop start during that and then everything that has happened since, that there are a lot more soft tissue injuries and those are continuing to, to grow at, 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 at quite a rate. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, you you read the book, you'll know more than, than I do, and the other doctor certainly will know more than both of us, I'm sure. But it does, yeah, yeah. Hamstrings, calf injuries, there seem to be more than ever. And um, yeah, you know, we suffered a another couple yesterday to to Nathaniel Mendes Lang. Um, you know, we want to say we've already got James Collins out. He was out running on the pitch yesterday, which is great for the fans to see. We're hoping he'll be back in action over the Easter weekend. Uh, Martin Waghorn's just come back. Connor Washington was back on the pitch yesterday. Craig Forsyth came back for one game last week. He's out with a calf injury again from there. Um, Sonny Bradley didn't help getting himself sent off yesterday, so that's another player we're short for the next three games. Um, it all adds up, but you know we can't moan any more than anybody else. I know Portsmouth no, no. have had the same. Bolton fans will be saying they've had the same. I don't know about Northampton's injuries, but I understand that, yeah, they were very short of defenders at the weekend as well. Yeah. So it runs through the league. We can't plead. The, you know, hardship on that on that front. Um, it will be tough till the end, but as I say, with six games to go, it's still in our hands, um, and that's where we'd like it to be. I mean, it it is absolutely relentless, Charles, isn't it? Uh, th this particular league and uh, and where everything that goes with this. We we're, we're doing an hour next. We've got Rick Parry from uh, the EFL joining us, uh, as well as. Uh, Gavin McGaw, who used to work uh, very closely with uh, Lord Marwini when he was uh, chair at the. Uh, football league as well and um, others too in the in the hour that we're going to dedicate to this is there anything 
that that you would like to see the regulator manage to do at all with Northampton Town or clubs in leagues one and two that uh, and, and the way that this money is going to be shared I think I think it's personally really really difficult for me to sort of sit here and go right we should do this or this should happen um I'm I'm a business owner so I I kind of I understand where, so our chairman, Kelvin Thomas, he is very for the regulator. I understand his reasons for that. And I I do think that there has been a case of all the money, the majority of the money being shared between not even 20 clubs in the Premier League, but, but probably six mm. to 10, maybe, realistically, who get the majority of it. And then there's a very small amount that actually then trickles its way down to the rest of, uh, you know, the English pyramid. And and that should be more. But at the same time, I, I kind of see where, you know, the, the chairman and the mm. owners of the, the big clubs would come from. You know, at the end of the day, people around the world tune in to watch Man United, Man City and, and Chelsea and everybody. They're the, the real pullers. And... You know, if it was my business and somebody sort of turned around to me and said, well, hang on a minute, there's this other person down here that isn't getting as much as you and you should help them out in some way financially, then I, I don't know how I would personally feel about it. It's got to be done in a way that is as fair as it can be, you know, possible mm. to be fair. I mean, the, the one thing that I have a potential issue with is that if everything gets based on how much we can earn. If we, if you take Northampton and Derby, for example, yeah. you know, Pride Park holds about four times, maybe not quite the four times the amount that Six Fields does, but it's it's a huge difference mm. to what we have. Now, if, I, if an owner wanted to come into Northampton, a new owner, and decided that they were going to go and put several millions in to expand the stadium or even build a new one, the way that I understand it is that they wouldn't necessarily be able to just go and put that money in in one lump sum. It mm. would have to be a certain percentage based on how much, you know, our turn turnover is or, or how much our income is. And obviously that will still mean that we will be far behind the likes of Derby. And that will be because of the historical way that football has been, you know. So over the years, Derby have been able to expand and, and grow whereas to a scale that we haven't been able mm. to do that whether that was because of money or because of whatever it was but um you know it still doesn't necessarily i think put everybody in a level playing field and at the same time it's sport exactly that's the other you know we know what it is that we're going to watch yesterday was a typical david versus the Gol goliath match really yeah yes we're both in the same division but we were huge underdogs. It's the first time we've ever beaten Derby in a competitive fixture. Just think about how much more happiness that that brings to me and, and mm. every single football fan that, that supports Northampton, um, you, you know, because of that disparity. Yeah. That that plays a big part. Of well, it. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's, it's like for me, I mean, I first watched Cambridge United in the early 60s. Uh, when I was taken along by my, my old man and my grandfather was there as well and I'd sit behind the goal in the non-league and then at half-time you could go back at the other end and it's sort of gone on from there. And actually being able now, because I'm not doing quite so much work as I was doing, uh, I've got my first ever season ticket. And what I like about it is if you go to watch your local team, you know, you still have the same feeling when they win or lose or when they perform well or they don't or they beat somebody. It doesn't actually matter about the standard you're watching. It's just about this is my club. And I think we sometimes forget that, don't you? Yeah, I, I do, for, for definite. I mean, you know, we've perennially yo-yoed between League One and League Two for the last however many years it's been now. And I know that you know, for the years that we've been in League Two, we've all wanted to get up into this higher division for games such as against Derby. You know, going to Bolton this season, um, you know, going to Derby, although they didn't end in particularly good results for us, it, it was still those types of games, those types of days out that we really <clears throat> yearned for. That's no disrespect to any of the teams that are in League Two, but there's a different 
caliber of club that seems to be in League One now. Now that you know, there are reasons yeah. why that has happened, and clubs like Derby probably shouldn't be in League One. Mm. But you know, that's the way that sport has brought us to this point, and yeah. and that's the way it's happened. And I, I, for one, really enjoy it. And the fact that we can go to all those different clubs has been fantastic yeah. this season. I, I agree with you, Nigel. What, what what about for you, Derby? Of course, you'll be looking at this hopefully. As far as Derby County are concerned, it's uh, back in the championship next season and uh, you will be part of, uh, what is it, Rick Perry would like this 20, the 25% in, you know, to come down and, uh, and everything like that. Is, do you think that this will work out and that the regulator in the end is a good idea? It's really difficult, isn't it? Um, it's a bit like Charles said there. You can see the business head of it and you say, well, yeah, the clubs that generate the revenue, why should they not be able to keep the revenue they generate? But as we know, football is kind of a unique industry because, you know, the, the fans are not consumers. We don't go when things are not well. Otherwise, you know, there wouldn't have been 27,000 at Pride Park yeah. every week for, for the last however many years. And, 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 you know, there wouldn't be the numbers at Northampton or, or at Cambridge or all the other clubs. Um, and somebody has got to protect these clubs for the future generations of, of fans like ourselves and make sure that, that situations, you know, as close as we got to, to not existing any longer, mm. um, don't happen again. So, you know, it's a real difficult um, line to get. And that's mm. if you believe the regulator can do the right things. Um, I've seen regulators in other industries. Um, and if you look at the state of the water industry in the, com in the country, uh, the number of electricity companies that went bust in the in the last few years. I'm not convinced that a regulator is the panacea that everybody thinks it is. Um, but, yeah, something has to be done. But I, right. I take Charles's point as well. You know, I always look at it from a lottery point of view. If somebody won 100 million euros on the Euro Millions next week and was a Derby County fan, why should they not be allowed to go and spend that on Derby County? Yeah. But the regulations prevent that. And the cynic in me says that's the big clubs protecting what they've got from from the other clubs and there are a number of derby fans but derby fans are uh, <laughs> that we've traveled in our numbers around league one for the last <laughs> couple of years getting tickets to, to away games has been tricky to say the yeah. least uh, and we filled the away end at, at northampton as we have done many this season um but you know that we would all love to be not in this division next year mm. but there are plenty of fans who will say do you know what i think i quite enjoy being in the championship is the Premiership all it's cracked up to be if you're not one of the big six clubs? Because it's, you know, you're just one of the also runs. Whereas in the Championship, you know, we're not under any illusions. We're not going to go straight up and compete in the top six next year. Who knows? You've got to consolidate. You've got to grow from there. But we have the fan base to get back to that yeah. top half of the table if we get there. But yeah, do we really want to be in the Premier League against sides who, you know, Northampton had a chance of beating us yesterday in League One. Yeah. realistically, if we play Manchester City, if we were to get in the Premier League in five or six years' time, you don't really have a chance of beating no. them. I know, there are so many fans. I know Southampton fans uh, that think exactly the same way. VAR is, is terrible. Just a final, very quick one with you, Charles. One of the great things about Six Fields is that lovely little programme and memorabilia shop you have. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah Cobbers Collectibles. It's really, really, really good. Um, I know Andy, who runs it, has done a terrific job. He's gone from being basically out the back of a van that he would just park up outside the stadium on a match day to now having his own purpose-built uh, room, if you like, yeah. that is just outside and opposite the main reception, which is which is fantastic. And it's not just Cobbler's memorabilia that he's got. He's no. got from all sorts of different clubs. It's great. I mean, it's... I, you know, every time that we've ever played crew in the last few years, I, I've always enjoyed going there because they've got this little tiny, you know, bricks and mortar shop. But it is, it's it's like a broom cupboard. Yeah, It's very small, but it's great. And just flicking through the old programs, seeing all the badges and, and all of that. So that, that's kind of what, you know, football is about, really. And I mean, you know, we, we sort of look at how... Uh, you know, we, we collect shirts when we're kids and then we grow up and we do we really want to be wearing a football shirt anymore when you get to sort of, you know, your 40s and plus. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, so you might start collecting other things and that might be the programmes yeah. or it might be badges Brilliant. and things. Yeah. And he's done a terrific job there. Yeah. Oh, well, great. Well, Charles and Nigel, as always, uh, great to be able to feature both of you and good luck with the rest of the season to both 
Derby County and of course Northampton Town. We're going down to League Two, Mansfield Matters. Simon Collison from Colchester, season ticket holder as well. And uh, Craig Priest, my guest's up next. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was moved another on from that. era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, uh, League One was uh, terrific. League Two will be just as uh, interesting, I know. Craig uh, Priest from Mansfield Matters podcast and Simon Collinson, Colchester uh, United season ticket holder. Gosh, I remember my Friday nights with uh, Cambridge United. Actually, not that long ago either um, at uh, Layer Road, uh, as it was, and some uh, big moments and some desperate ones down the years. Gentlemen, uh, terrific to have uh, both of you uh, here. And, um, well, all square uh yesterday let's go to mansfield first of all if uh, we may and um talk uh, to craig and uh craig just to, first of all about the game yesterday yeah frustrating one from our point of view the conditions really really affected the way we play then you add into that colchester united's the cowley brothers the way that they really set up you know they're scrapping at the bottom of the league aren't they so they're going to run the clock down at every single moment they get they knew that that would get on our fans back and it sort of played into their hands really really well and in the end we were quite fortunate to come away with a point but mm. nigel Clough's mantra is very much that if we can you know if we go behind in the game get a goal back and at least take a draw out of it and take something out of it and put the pressure on uh, on others so from our point of view certainly not the the football that we used to certainly not the uh, the result which we would have uh, hoped to going into that game but a point to point and it keeps us at the top of the table and gives us some uh, some real momentum going into uh, 
what's going to be a big seven games to go. I mean, this is the thing now, isn't it, for Mansfield? If you look at where you are and the sides behind you, I mean, it's three to go up and then, of course, the playoff places. It's a difficult one, isn't it, to think that because you're, you, you really, as fans now, think just keep this going. We don't want the nonsense of the playoffs. Absolutely that. We were burnt by that a couple of years ago in the in the playoff final. Nigel Clough's first full season in charge, of course. And then last season, missing out on the playoffs by just one goal. For us, you know, we could sit here and, and talk about it. And I know a lot of journalists will be sort of going, well, Mansfield are top of the table. You can win the league. We do not care about winning Skybet League 2 at all. Mm-hmm. All we want to do is finish in that top three. You know, we're in a good position. We're where we are on, on merit. But we just want to get up in that top three and not have to go through the living nightmare, which is the playoffs. Because, you know what, if we fell into it at this point of the season, having been where we've been and done what we've done so far, it would be a dreadful thing because the momentum, the mindset would be absolutely lost. And then, of course, you come up against a team that's got up in the final day. So Mm. top three, please, anything will do. Yeah, exactly that. Simon, a, a really important point for you, I think, yesterday, with those games in hand that you've got just outside that bottom two. Oh, definitely. I think if you asked any fan on the way up there, Steve, would we take a point? Would it have been anyone's hands off? I think we were very much of the opinion we were going up there to see how far we'd come under Cowleys, but weren't really expecting anything to show positive for it and you know, getting the early goal. And, yeah, I know there's a lot of Mansfield fans who are quite frustrated with the sort of the, the element of how we set up in the gamesmanship. But at the end of the day, we are fighting for our very football survival in the premium pyramid of the Football League. So anything we're going to get a slight bonus or a slight plus or give us an advantage we're going to try and take and i think coming away from it there's actually a little bit of an element of disappointment in regards to the fact we didn't go on and maybe snatch a late winner which although i think draw was probably the fair result in the end i'd have quite happy taken a, a last minute winner and got all three points but with <clears throat> forest green losing that was a massive plus help for us and i'll be it really is still in our own hands yeah. where as long as we match or beat them you know what they're getting we will stay up but it's just, yet again, another season as a Colchester fan where we're at the wrong end of the table and just things that aren't really going our way. And hopefully with the Cowleys in now, the Mansfield result will springboard the rest of our season and move on to the summer and more positive things. Exactly. That's exactly what uh, you've got to hope for. Of course, we're, we're into the busy uh, Easter period now. You've got a home game coming up, haven't you, on a Good Friday, I guess it will be. Yeah, that is. And like we said, I think the point this weekend will only be good if we back out with three points on Friday. Yeah. That's the key. You know, too many times this season we've got a decent result and then got and blown it in the next game, so to speak. So yeah, Friday's probably a bigger game than actually Saturday was for us. So let's talk um, about the clubs themselves. Colchester United, first of all, a club that, uh, <clears throat> when you're old as I am, will remember all the great moments in the FA Cup. And then obviously it always used to be, used to have a, a lot of Friday night games, of course, uh, uh, um, at Lair Road and everything in the past, under the flood, floodlights in whatever division. You're a season ticket holder at Colchester United, Simon. Has that, have they gone up? this not in price but as there many more season ticket holders as there seems to have been as people are returning more to their local clubs than perhaps uh, stretching it more just to uh, go and watch uh, the, the top division i think to be fair this year there has been an increase i don't know the exact percentage but the chairman has come out and said we've had more season tickets sold but i think we're up against it quite a lot because yeah. up the road we've got ipswich and then down the road, well, down the train track, so to speak, we've got West Ham. Mm. And if you look at Colchester's dynamic, there's a lot of, it's a garrison town and it's a student town. So there's a garrison town, most of the soldiers, I used to be in the eye myself, mm. and no, you go home at weekends, or if you've got a bit of cash play, they'll go and watch an Ipswich game or West Ham game. Mm. And also students are going to have their own loyalty. So I think we've got quite a small fan base and a select few who will actually go and watch. What we do tend to have is quite a, a steady crowd so we might not be the biggest but both home and away away we tend to take the same sort of 150 200 people every way game and our home games you know we average probably about 3,500 maybe four four thousand mm. like for some crazy reason the Wrexham game seems to be pretty much sold out I can't tell why that's happened yeah well no I mean that's uh just part of the the, the, the Wrexham uh, um <laughs> way isn't it and everything that's gone on with uh with that club and the document, just for people to see. But um, what about for Mansfield as well then? It's, uh, 
Are, are you in the shadow of others, really? I, I guess you are. I guess you could say so. Obviously, you've got Nottingham Forest, you know, just down the road in, in, the, in the city. But, and, of course, they've been fighting to get up into the Premier League for a long time. But actually, I'd say we're the complete opposite. Mm. Man, Nigel Clough has really put bums on seats. The, the owners, John and Carolyn Radford, have really invested in the club. And actually, since the, the COVID pandemic, we've seen more and more supporters come yeah. through the turnstiles in Mansfield because I think they've realised what they've missed. They've realised that whole Saturday afternoon, Tuesday night, whatever it may be, that camaraderie, being around other people. And when you put on the football, which we've been putting on over the last three years, you know, we're not top of League Two now because of what we've done this season. We're where we are because of the work we've done over the last three years. Mm -hmm. And that's kept people coming back. We've had over 5,000 season ticket holders uh, this year. We're selling out our home allocation week upon week. We've now just started to reclaim back a little bit of the North Stand when... Um, there are clubs yeah. that aren't going to bring so many supporters, so we've got that little bit of extra section. And honestly, that extra 150, 200 gets snapped up on a Saturday afternoon before you can even blink. So I think for us, it's, it's the opposite. Whilst Nottingham Forest have stepped up just down the road in the city to the Premier League, we're actually seeing the reverse effect. People are wanting to come and see League Two football. People are wanting to come and see something competitive and, and go on a bit mm. of a journey. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm completely with you and I completely understand all of that. And it feels real still, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. It, it, it is that thing. It is that thing of you get people now who are playing for our club as well. I think what what helps is the fact that we've built a team based on people that are from the local area. You know, Aidan Flint, the captain's from Pinkston, just down the road. You know, we've got a number of other players in and around our squads that live in the area that have, have come from around the area and people who even have come from further afield that have adopted the area as their club. And it's it's fantastic to to see that people have sort of jumped on board with that and it's just we've just created this real community cohesion mm. around the club which goes to, from the top all the way down to, to the very bottom and I think people just want a part of that and it helps when you're playing good football of course. Of course it does and for Colchester United uh, a similar sort of thought for me I, I still think that the structure of the, of the loan situations although some says we need that because it um, we can't afford other ways of getting players in there are quite a lot of pretty average or players that come from higher divisions loaned to first and second division clubs. And these players are not offered jot. And I think it's it, it, it's a waste of everybody's time. Oh, no, I, I agree. I think this year we've, well, in previous years, we've been quite guilty of snuffing up loan players in the summer mm. and giving them a, a few games or they've been coming to us injured and we've ended up rehabbing them and then maybe giving them a few games to get back if they've been recalled. But to be fair to again, the Cowley sort of input, if you like, the loan players we brought in in January since they've arrived are very much players we are then going to look to sign and take with us on the journey next year. I think as the, Danny said himself, it's more about getting people in, getting them to see the club, the fan base, the area and everything, and kind of making those connections, then hoping we can sell the club enough to them to then want to stay on. Good likes of Alison Smith, mm. Ricardo Bosco, mm. people like that we've got in about some, you know, massively improves what we've got because let's be fair we weren't in the bottom half or well, bottom five really of league two for reasons other than the fact we weren't good enough mm. and by bringing loan players in it has helped us out and at least this way around we've got loan players in january who are going to help us through to summer previously we've had loan players in the summer come to january they leave joe taylor prime example is somehow is now a top scorer at lincoln and colchester this season you know as we'll see so yeah it does it doesn't help and and going back to what you say about watching League Two football, mm. I think it's the connection you can get with the players and the manager, the fact you can actually get up close, talk to them, speak to them. Yeah. Even like I'm good friends with the kit man at Colu just through sort of talking to at games and stuff like that. And I think that's what people don't get with the high divisions and what is one of the abuses of League Two and League One, to be fair. Mm. We've got a, we haven't got an awful lot of time, but just one question to each of you, uh, if I may. Uh, we're talking about football governance and the regulator. What would you like... Um, Rick Parry, the EFL chief executive, to be fighting for League Two clubs, most of all. Uh, let's come to you um, first, if I may, Craig. I think it's a fair crack of the whip in terms of the money that filters down from the top level. Um, you know, clubs, there are a lot of clubs in League Two that could really do with that, that sort of investment. And I think the other thing would just be 
uh, a better standard of referee and I think you're starting to see it week upon week now so Nigel Clough's a big advocate of that I know many other fans and, ma and managers are Nigel Clough said it actually the other night at a fans forum they're, they're not refereeing for the players and for the love of the game anymore they're refereeing for themselves and the marks in the books and that's not the way the game should be no, that's some good points Simon yeah, no, I agree with the referee comment. I think that was one of the good things about having the Manchester Ventures. The Mansfield Cultures game on TV, that actually a wide audience got to see how poor the officials actually are. But no, I think I agree with everything that was said there. Was, we do need to understand that football in the country doesn't stop at Championship and Premier League. There is a lower pyramid and money, facilities and a fair share of things got cracked down. I quite like the German method where you have obviously a fan base involved with the running of the club so I think that could help but yeah I just think we need some more of a level playing field to be fair because League 1 League 2 are very similar if the gap comes we then jump up the championship and that's why I think clubs find it hard to make that gap. Mm. Gentlemen uh, it's been terrific to speak to both of you for various different reasons uh, I hope you both have a great end to the season as well. Mark Palios will be joining us the co-owner chairman of Tranmere Rovers, Gavin McGaw, former EFL executive, former Brentford chief, Andrew Mills and Rick Parry, chairman of the EFL. We have an hour to come on football governance, the bill and the independent regulator. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Good <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to have the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
have lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut food, a spin in the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. We're going to spend an hour talking about football regulation and what is the regulator of our football for. And I'm delighted to say that Andrew Mills and Gavin McGaw, former EFL executive Gavin and former Brentford chief executive Andrew, who are regulars on the programme, are with me. Uh, later on, we'll be hearing from Mark Palios as well, the uh, Tranmere uh, chair. And uh, I'm delighted to say that Rick Parry, the man uh, in charge, really, of the Football League as chairman of the EFL to help sort and guide all of this through. Uh, Rick and uh, Andrew and Gavin, a very good evening to all of you, uh, first of all. Uh, Rick, if I'm just before I even come and talk about all of this, a touch of class from Liverpool with uh, Sven Joran Eriksson this weekend. That was that that was really shows what our football's about, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. Wonderful afternoon. Great. Now, firstly, what would be the first thing that you would now like to say to fans of EFL clubs as to how you are going to help them going forward? Well, we've been trying our level best to help them uh, over the last few years. I think the um, regulator, from our point of view, is going to be a huge step. Um, it's going to be different for clubs. It's going to present challenges. Um, but the EFL has been supportive throughout the process. We engage constructively with Tracy Crouch during the fan-led review. Uh, we have welcomed the government's white paper and we have welcomed the bill. Um, because from our point of view, our purpose is making clubs sustainable. Um, and many of them aren't sustainable in, in the current climate. Um, and what we're trying to do in that is to secure, as I said, long-term sustainability, make the clubs resilient from fans' point of view, make sure their clubs exist and aren't going to be facing financial catastrophe all the time. The tension, of course, there and the paradox we've got to grapple with the, with the fans is, of course, the fans want to see their clubs sustainable but most of all, they want to see their club successful. And of course, if it's a question of who owns those clubs and who are the directors of those clubs, mm -hmm. they want to reach the promised land of either the Championship and possibly the Premier League one day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and nothing wrong with ambition because that's what the sport is all about. Uh, but as I said, from the FL's point of view, what we're trying to do is to make sure that clubs can rise and fall up and down the pyramid without facing catastrophe. And the problem at the moment is there, there are just too many fault lines. It's just it's, it's too difficult getting upwards. And again, when you when you fall back out of the Premier League, um, we, we need a softer landing. We need we need to close gaps. We need to uh, we need to have fairer shares. And what we definitely can't have is the unfair competition that we have in the championship created by the parachute payments 
we we have to level that playing field. And just one final one at this, and then Gavin and Andrew will come in, I'm sure, as well, and we'll we'll all talk <coughs> and discuss this in detail. Is um, what what for you do you want to see and your relationship be when whether it's 25 2025 or 26 when the regulator comes in what's your role for fans of a club like mine Cambridge United so I, I think that um, from the FL's perspective as I said we we're going to work constructively with the regulator um, we uh, there, are, there are going to be unknowns, um, but the regulator is there to ensure that individual clubs are more resilient. It's there to ensure that the the game, the pyramid, is more resilient. It is there to ensure that fans have a greater say, greater input um, to their club's plans, that heritage assets are protected. So there's an awful lot of really, really good stuff in there. It's something that we're embracing and looking forward to. Um, it, it is going to be different. It is going to be challenging. And, it, and in a sense, the game should be hanging its head in shame because we've had 30 years to sort it out ourselves and we haven't proved capable of doing so. Um, but as I said, we're, um, we're actually really looking forward to a bright new future mm. under a new regime. One of the difficulties, of course, uh, uh, Gavin uh, and Andrew as well here, Gavin, I'll come to you first, is that <coughs> you have... Um, various different people who in whatever business and however they've done it uh, they've they think they're successful enough or have got enough about them to take over a club if one becomes available or they're going to do this and spend to get something that they possibly don't really have uh, the uh, financial acumen to uh, get together but all have a go that means this is still going to have to be um, looked at in a very sympathetic way with the game and the the clubs themselves and that fan base. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mark. And first of all, I want to say to Rick, uh, well done uh, for coming on tonight. I think it shows great transparency and openness to fans that you're doing this sort of thing. And uh, well done as well for keeping our clubs together, the EFL, through the last few years, because I know it's been difficult. Um, what I would say, Mark, with all of this, is that I think we're looking at this absolutely positively in terms of fan engagement and things like owners and directors tests which i'm sure rick and even the pl would be delighted to get rid of because it's a nightmare uh, and it costs a fortune and by the way the idea that these regulators are going to cost 10 million quid is a joke it's going to cost way more than that if it's looking into many cases of owners etc but the thing that worries me the big thing that worries me is if you look at the government press release you've got rishi sunak talking about the unscrupulous owners in football You've got them talking about 64 clubs since the Premier League coming in, gone into administration, but only seven of those in the last 10 years. So the trend's downwards. Mm -hmm. And I just would say we need to be really careful here about talking the game and the owners down because we'll actually really hurt um, the EFL owners particularly um, the opportunities for other people to come in and invest in clubs. I think that's dangerous. I think there's been a lot of political dog whistling from politicians jumping on this. And I hope that our regulator will get it right because it needs to be, and they've talked about a light touch, they've talked about advocacy first approach, but it needs to be. We need to let the football people be at the forefront of this, don't they, Rick? Or there's going to be dangers. Hmm. Rick, football people, light yourself at the front to sort this out. That's what's needed. I think it's a balance and um, inevitably there's been some rhetoric, but I think if you actually read the bill, uh, it's a really thorough piece of work. It's been well put together. Uh, it's, it's hardly been rushed. It's been um, at least 12 months in the making. And um, in terms of its light touch approach, in terms of the requirements on the regulator to liaise with the leagues, um, I think it's, listen, proof of the pudding is going to be in who's appointed because the regulator is going to have wide discretion. Um, you touched on owners and directors, um, not just would it be nice from the league's point of view to be able to get rid of some of the work, but I think one of the big pluses, for example, when it comes to owners and directors is the statutory powers that a regulator will have to gather information, uh, the penalties for clubs, should they provide false information, mm -hmm. will be potentially criminal. Um, so I think we're going to see greater transparency because football 
in common with many sports, does like to live in the dark. Uh, for me, transparency is absolutely at the core of good governance. And because this is going to be a public body, transparency will be at the centre. Um, so I think we're going to shine a light on many more problems. As I said, the statutory powers, I think, are really incredibly helpful. Uh, and provided it is light touch and provided there is proper liaison with the leagues, then mm -hmm. I, I can see this actually adding um, to the attractions of the game going forward. And I think it can do us a great service. When your owner comes to you, Andrew, as he would have done that when it, you were working at uh, Brentford and, and, and what have you, <coughs> what, what, what is it that you want to see that the regulator will understand from individual clubs? Good evening, gents. Um, look, I think it, I think it's a, I think it's an invidious position. I think it's a difficult, a very difficult job. However, having read the bill, and it, let, let's safe to say it's the first bill I've ever read from 137 cover to cover. pages. Yeah, it, I mean, again, it, it's uh, it, I did it over three nights. It wasn't particularly <laughs> exciting, and, and nobody in the house wanted to join me. Um, <laughs> however, in doing so, and and Gavin will know the first time I met. Gavin was coming to consult with me when I was at Brentford. Um, the first time I, I, I ever spoke to Rick was was in trying to buy and loan players from Liverpool when I was at Charlton. So, you, you know, everybody everybody here tonight is is well versed in, in in football parlance. My initial thought was was not wanting government anywhere near um, a, a, a kind of football governance. However, as I think Rick alluded to earlier, you know. Football's had a long time to sort this out, and and for whatever reason hasn't. And if you ask me for whatever reason, for whatever reason is because it's very difficult to get people to think above their individual <coughs> necessity of their own business. Mm -hmm. and, and and that it, therein lies back to where Gavin was suggesting is you know these these businesses are are reliant on being propped up or being driven by essentially an individual or a number of individuals who. You know, again, it takes significant sums, so so they will always have an individualistic view. I actually, having read this this bill now, genuinely think the things that it suggests it's going to get involved with would be extremely helpful. Mm. However, I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's a fix-all. We have some significant issues with with distribution of funds within the leagues, and 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 that's an an argument that's been been kind of bubbling on for 20 years the interesting thing we have in 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 rick's position is that it's it's very difficult to overlook the 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 erosion of of the efl powers every time they've called for cash now yeah. rick's in a really interesting position and i don't mean to talk about you rick but rick's in a really interesting position is he was sat at the premier league when when mm -hmm. the efl and me as part of the executive were unfortunately uh, focused into giving away many of the bedrock uh, uh, of the things that we could now be bargaining with. So, you know, again, I think it's understanding where we're at. I think it is absolutely a benefit. But I think, as we've said week in, week out, and as and as Rick and his executives are trying to fix, the actual model itself is is kind of broken. Mm -hmm. So you're nodding your head there, Rick. Uh, first of all, your answer to that as well. You, you you feel. I mean, you are in a good position, having, uh, you know, had your position <coughs> at uh, one of the best, um, greatest clubs uh, in the country, and now very much uh, looking to what you can do percentage-wise. You're going for the 25 percent here, aren't you, for the EFL straight off and and what have you? But with what Andrew was saying there. Is there going to be the will on all sides or is your job, along with the regulator, going to be pretty challenging? It is going to be challenging. I, um, the only word I would challenge Andrew on is the model isn't kind of broken. The model is broken. The model really is broken mm -hmm. because, you know, if you go back to when we formed the Premier League in 1992, Turnover of the Premier League was 45 million. Turnover of the FL was 34 million. A gap of 11 million, you know, bridgeable. The gap is now in excess of 3 billion. That's the gap. That's the chasm that we're trying to bridge. And we've touched a little bit on the dependence on owners, the reliance upon owners who are extraordinarily committed. Owner funding is brilliant until it isn't. 
And we're not so much concerned with the Berries, the Macclesfields. We're more concerned with what happens in the championship with the Derbys, the Boltons, the Reddings. You know, Mel Morris had a real go. Mel Morris came in. Who, who would have uh, ever thought that Mel Morris was anything other than a fantastic owner? £250 million pounds and failures to get into the Premier League later, and Mel's had enough. At which point, it's administration, the club falls off a cliff. Mm. Bolton the same. Reading, we've seen the same. Dai Yong didn't come in as a bad owner. He came in and spent hundreds of millions in trying to get to the promised land and didn't. And then one day decides he isn't going to fund anymore. Wigan, we had exactly the same. We had fan groups coming to us and saying, we'd love to take the club over. We said, brilliant. Have you got 15 million quid? Well, what do we need that for? Well, that will be your annual losses in the championship. Forget about buying the club. Mm -hmm. These are the imbalances. And getting this voted for within football is, is frankly, an impossibility. So having that external influence, um, we think, is going to be extraordinarily important. And again, we've been trying in earnest for four years to talk redistribution with the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Government has been pushing both of us really, really hard to try and get a solution. We haven't done. We haven't even got close. And one of the things that I'm most excited about, really excited about with the bill, is the requirement for um, the state of the game review, which will be the first comprehensive, transparent, wholly independent review of the finances of the game. And that will be what the regulator basically uses to set its objectives. So the sooner that state of the game review mm. is carried out from our perspective, we'd love to see that produced within the next six months uh, because the output from that is going to be very revealing and incredibly useful. So what, what would you also say to the regulator uh, on this too, Rick, when it comes to <coughs> a Premier League that hasn't welcomed the regulator in the way that the EFL has? Uh, well, it's going to be law. So the regulator is going to have a significant amount of uh, power and responsibility. I'm sure any regulator worth their salt will want to engage with Premier League clubs because, again, for any well-run club or any club that's doing things half right, there isn't an awful lot to fear in here. Um, this isn't going to be necessarily draconian. Every fan should be consult every club rather should be consulting with their fan base. Mm. You know wh why wouldn't they? We're not talking golden shares or fans on boards. We're talking about sensible um, consultation processes and, and who could quarrel with that. We're talking about proper governance codes. Well, I mean, who could quarrel with proper governance? We have a sense of responsibility. You know, the, the game is massively important to the nation. So mm. why shouldn't we be governed properly? So, as I said, we should be embracing this and and collaborating, cooperating with the regulator yeah. and all making the best of it. Gav? Yeah, look, Rick, I think what you've said is really interesting and I agree with most of it. The, the thing I sort of always have a problem with is the EFL mindset that they just should be given the money from the Premier League. I had the problem when I was in the PL in the first place. And part of this comes, it's what you said, you know, it was only 10 million gap between the two divisions at the start. But that's because the Premier League's become the most phenomenally successful league on the planet. And the point is we should welcome that because the money is going to be coming down and solidarity payments have proven that. But what I would ask really is if more money comes in, and I know that you've been very vocal about the regulator, uh, but and, and part of that is so you can get more income for the EFL clubs that you represent <coughs> and fair play for that. But if you get this big check from the Premier League in addition every year, how are you going to stop that? becoming just inflation on players' wages and prices, which is causing the chaos in the championship as it is. So we're not looking for handouts. Let's just get that straight. This isn't the FL putting its hand in the Premier League's pocket. This is all about rebalancing. And this is all about whether we value the pyramid. If we don't want promotion and relegation, you know, that's fine. But then that's if I look at the value of the Premier League then. It's the variety at the bottom, not just the, the success of the biggest clubs, that is the strength of the Premier League. And if you look at the 14 clubs in the Premier League that have not been there since the start, on average, they've been in the Premier League for 13 years each. Now, that means 
by definition, they've been in the EFL for 19 years each. If you look at the EFL, if you look at the 14 clubs who've had the longest period in the Premier League that are now in the EFL, how many years have they been in the Premier League? Well, 13, funnily enough. So they've made just as great a contribution to building the brand that is the Premier League as the clubs that are currently in it. So it's, you know, it's not their money. This is about the pyramid. And it's not about two leagues. This is about, really is about the 116 clubs that are part of the pyramid. Do, you know, Luton, when we were forming the Premier League, yeah. were in the first division. They voted on the constitution of the Premier League. They played a real part, never got into the Premier League because they were relegated. They've been down, they've had a substantial spell in the National League. Now they're the 51st club to join the Premier League. Is that not what English football is all about? Mm -hmm. It's all about balance. So, yeah, of course, the Premier League is a great success. We want our biggest and best clubs winning in Europe. But it's all about the pyramid. Uh, and giving clubs that ability to rise, as I said, without facing catastrophe. We are absolutely committed to proper cost control. There's no question about that. We have introduced hard salary caps. Uh, we had a blip over the legality of the process. Um, our clubs in the championship have talked about uh, when we were discussing the potential offer from the Premier League, they were very much up for uh, putting limits on owner funding reducing owner funding from 15 million a club to 5 million a club. And the point is, if you're going to make clubs sustainable, it needs two things. One is it needs redistribution because they're not solvent. But hand in hand with that, it needs better regulation. The, the two are inseparable. We have never said, give us money. We have said, let's reduce that dependence on owner funding. Let's make the club solvent and let's bring better regulation to make them sustainable and, in the long term. It's all about that total package. And th thank you for your time. Just one final question to you, Rick. Um, and we are going to speak more uh, to others in, in the, the coming uh, 35 minutes left <laughs> in this hour. One, one thing for you, I mean, it's got cross-party support, so we're in an election year anyway. Are you hopeful that whoever it is comes in decides the sort of regulator that you can work with? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, we think this is going... Well, we hope this is going to proceed through Parliament relatively swiftly. It needs to be done before the election, mm -hmm. so um, we're not looking years away. We're looking months away. Yeah. Absolutely critical to appoint the right regulator, of course, with the right mix of skills. Um, probably somebody with... Uh, a lot of legal experience and knowledge, not necessarily a lawyer, but certainly uh, a real understanding because this is quite a complex bill. Um, somebody with objectivity, uh, that's incredibly important, that right level of independence. Um, but as I said, when, when the regulator comes in, uh, they'll, they'll find that we are there ready to collaborate and cooperate. Rick Parry, thank you very much indeed for taking time out tonight to speak to us here on the Sunday Night Club. And uh, the, you've heard it there from Rick, chairman of the uh, English Football League, and hoping that there is a swift conclusion, cross-party support, and that the bill becomes law, obviously, before the next election. Andrew Mills and Gavin McGaw remaining with us. Mark Pallius, co-owner, chairman of Tranmere Rovers, a former executive within the Football Association. He joins us as well next here on Talk TV. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're Absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. You said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> The Football Governance Bill, the Independent Football Regulator, and uh, we heard there from Rick Parry, who is the Chief Executive of the EFL, and his thoughts on where we are. Um, we're also going to be joined by Mark Pallius, co-owner and chairman of Tranmere Rovers, uh, during the next part of the show. But Andrew Mills and Gavin McGaw, very much part of all of this, both of them with uh, real insights within the boardroom and, uh, obviously, uh, the, the seats of power in this game. Uh, Gavin and uh, Andrew, if I come to you two first of all here, what more is it now that, um, Gavin, if I come to you really, that needs to be done here? It's all, there's, there's going to be a lot of sparring at this stage and nobody's quite sure. What, who do we really need as a regulator f from both of you? Who would you like? Somebody like yourself, Gavin? No, 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 no. I mean, I'm dull as it is, Mark. You need someone even duller than I am. Probably Andrew. Andrew would be good. Yeah, um, yeah. Only joking, Andrew. But um, <laughs> you need you need someone who's not going to be in the headlines. The big yeah. danger here is, and I think this is at the heart of it, Mark, and I really worry about the dog whistling around it, as I said, but I also... I'm concerned that everyone thinks the regulator is going to solve their problems, whether it's TV fixtures, too many of them, whether it's ticket prices, too expensive. Every fan thinks it's going to solve everything, and it simply is not. So you don't want someone who's going to come front and centre and become a name that every fan turns to, because it'll be overrun. 
And that's the expectation problem we've already set up with the regulator. And I do, I just will repeat this, we need a regulator, but we've got this wrong in terms of heightening expectation and expecting the world from it, because that is not going to be what it is in reality. Softly, softly then, Andrew. Uh, not so much for me. I think I think this is the problem. I think, I think, by the way, I'm not disagreeing with Gavin. I think it's spot on. However, the issue is we still have regulator or no regulator. We still have the same problems. Rick mentioned a number of owners, all of which, let me tell you, pass the director's fit and proper persons test. All of them. So that doesn't change. Um, I think I think what a regulator can do is acknowledge and identify the problems and start to try and work through them whereas i think what we've what we've had previously is 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 possibly the problems have been pushed to the side and we're kind of pointed in another direction and i and i and i find there's a, there's you know there's there's lots of talk about about shiny things over there when actually as we said and we've said several times and i was trying to be slightly polite about you know the model being kind of broke we know it's broken um mm. so how do we how do we start dealing with that well these are these are day one problems that need to be identified acknowledged and actually put on a list that we then work through but as i said having having been and an, an a question gab because i'm because i am dull enough to to read through this bill having read through the bill i was pleasantly surprised i genuinely pleasantly surprised with with the remit because i think it i think it i mean it's in front of me so the opening to the bill is to establish an independent football regulator to make provision for the licensing of football clubs and to make provision about the distribution of revenue received by organizers of football competitions that's it so if it sticks to that and sticks to some of these issues then i think it is going to help i just as we've all said i i don't think this is the panacea i don't think it's the answer to all of our problems no, well, of course it's not well uh, co-owner and chair of uh, tranmere Rovers, Mark Palios uh, joins us right now. Mark, good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the, the debate as well. F first of all, from the, the, the sort of chair or ownership, do you actually know what this regulator is going to want from you or you're going to want from them? Um, I certainly know what I uh, would want from a regulator to the extent that, you know, you can't really write the heist brief at this point in time. Um, and that's not just as a, a you know an owner of a lower league football club. Um, I actually played as a pro um, for 17 years with pro clubs, and I was also the chief exec of the FA. Mm. So I understand the governance aspects of the game. And you know the reality is that over the years, um, people don't realise that the, the the national governing body model was given to sport by the Victorians. And since you know the 19th century, um, elite sport has changed, and it's been attacked by say attacked. It's been it's been grown by both globalization and commercialization. As a consequence, it's outgrown um, the the remit of the FA, for example, or national governing body. And we've got to the point whereby the power is vested in the people who own the commercial interests in the competitions, basically. And that's right across all sports. That's cricket. That's you know whatever you want to look at. You, you can see this um, globalization happening. So mm. if you then start to look at our national game and say that you know are the FA, the FA are absent without leader to my mind. Whenever anything major has happened over the period of time, when I was at the FA, I know that they had um, basically almost given up um, running, uh, uh, administering the professional game and handed that over to the professional game. Now, this is where you come to an independent regulator because you need somebody who doesn't have a vested interest in looking at these situations. And we don't have that. If you, if you look at the Premier League, um, they clearly want to protect the Premier League. And I think that's right. The Premier League should actually be looked at by the regulation. So you need to, you need to protect the goose that lays the golden egg, uh, but not at the, at, the, at the risk of the pyramid. So the pyramids, for me, sorry, for me, what the, what, what, any major changes that happen have to do two things. One is they have to address the gaps in the pyramid that exist at this point in time. And two is it needs to address the whole of the pyramid. And that last bit is quite important because, you know, the, the deal that was put on the table by the Premier League, it wasn't, it wasn't actually put on the table, it was floated across <laughs> EFL. And I'm sure we've told you about that. Uh, didn't include anything going down into the National League. And if you look at the National League, 
We were in the National League for three years. Wrexham were there, Bristol Rovers were there. So many good league clubs were actually in the National League that you just can't cut it adrift. And the second thing on that is this is what a lot of people don't really understand, and I'd probably take issue with Rick on this. Um, the lower league clubs are not really represented by the EFL. The EFL has for many years now tried to keep hold, keep hold of the championship, and as a consequence, they've got a voting system that is really dominated by the championship to keep the championship within the EFL. And so when you're talking about it representing, uh, the EFL representing um, all the EFL clubs, I don't think that happens because, you know, if you're looking at the way some of the uh, the commercial income is shared out, the, the, the surplus is it's 80, 12, 8, basically. And so all that does is, is continue to uh, um, increase the gaps in the pyramid. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of thought needs to go into financial flow and part six of the bill um, basically needs a rewrite. And it needs a rewrite because the, the two parties that retain the power, which is the, EF, the, the Premier League and the EFL, or rather, should I say the Championship, because they own most of the revenue. Um, if you look at part six, the, the regulator is going to stand back. He's got no immediate responsibility for funds flow. Now, there are lots of different aspects that need to be fixed. Yeah. But one of the major ones, I think one of your previous commentators just said the here and now, you need to address funds flow. Lots of other things you need to do, OADT, uh, wage regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but just park that for now. If you're looking at funds flow, um, the financial, the regulators are actually saying, well, you know, if the AFL and the Premier League can't agree a deal, and they've singly failed to agree a deal for long enough, and if they do, it will be uh, incremental, not transformational, mm -hmm. then what will happen is um, it will trigger one of them, either the Premier League or the AFL will trigger the backstop. So the, the two guys, the two principal components of this will have the power and they'll be the ones and the power rests currently with the owner of the media rights. So it's the same people who are going to uh, trigger a, a backstop. So the, 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 the regulator is well away from actually helping to change this in the short term. And I actually believe that that's what needs to be changed mm. primarily as it goes, as the bill passages, passes through so, Parliament. Gavin, coming on, coming on this as well at this point. So factors here that the government says won't be in the regulators' remit as well. Is, is this going further, f far enough? Or as uh, Mark was saying there, certainly things need to be rewritten. I, I think Mark's just given one of the best synopses of this uh, bill I've heard so far, Mark. That's a really good, clear overview of it and its problems. Uh, and I'm not far away from you, Mark, and what, what you're saying at all. I think the problem has been the lobbying has very much come from championship side of things uh, and representations being about bridging the gap between the championship and the Premier League. And I actually don't think that's the problem here. I never have seen that as the problem. There are two distinctly different things and you do need to allow them to spend the money to go up, hence parachute payments and all of that when they come down to allow them to compete. But the real issue is getting the money into the game, particularly lower leagues where clubs are more likely uh, to feel after they usually have overspent in the championship mm -hmm. and ensuring that any additional money that comes in is uh, spent in the right way it's got to be core to this because i know clubs like yourself mark will spend it in the right way yeah. but that's not necessarily going to happen up in the championship and uh, that none of that gets resolved with this bill and, none of it and just one more on uh, from you here gavin at this point forensically i remember you talking to me a lot about when you were at the football league expensively uh, out of uh, kilter with with what can be done to make sure that you've got a, a fit and proper owner coming in that it oh. would just cost too much money yeah, to, absolutely to i mean I, I remember the amount of money that was spent trying to look into the uh, offshore elements of things like Notts county remember that horrible case for Notts county back in the day and um uh etc and it was it was just ridiculous and brian winnie at the time just had enough he said right enough's enough and he tried to simplify some of the rules it needs to go further and uh, there is a hope. I think that is one area though where the licensing will be helpful because as Rick Parry said earlier, if people lie, which some people did previously by the way, there's potential uh, criminal um, uh, consequences, but it costs a fortune and I just think the 10 million pounds for how much the, um, uh, the this mm. 
person will cost or this organisation will cost is a joke. A regulator will cost way more than that in reality. Just come back to you, Mark, and thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, joining us uh, tonight on this. Is What sort of character would you like to see involved then as who comes in as the regulator? Um, uh, so, sorry, can I, can I change it and just ask Gavin one thing? Yeah, of course you could do whatever you like. That's the whole beauty I, I of this I'm show. I'm interested in his view on this. Um, it, one of the things that um, you, you talk, I, I always talk about, if you're at A and you want to get to C, you've got to go through B. So I think you have to recognise, and I think one of your earlier guys was saying this, that when a regulator comes in, you've got to actually move from what I would say is your current environment into a lot, in, into, and it's going to take years to do it, into a situation where clubs, by and large, move away from a hand-to-mouth existence, which fails them, which means they cannot build their balance sheets. That's to, not just me as an accountant speaking here, but your balance sheets get built so you can ride a run of bad luck, basically. So that's a long-term play. And, but let's just turn to the officers and directors test. Because if you stand back and look at this industry, it is entirely unusual, in my experience, to see it rely so much on such an unreliable form of finance which is owner funding mm. and you then suddenly if you look at it from that perspective and that's something that maybe the independent regulator needs to look at broadly you might actually see that the oadt the officers and directors test is it's it's important but it's less important if you reduce the reliance on owner funding sorry i just make that point no, that's a I'm, really good point well, 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 Mark, Mark, I think you're spot on. I think also there will come down to the funding plans for their clubs, but also where the source of funds are. That will be more important than actually who they are and what their past record is at other places. That will be, have they got the money today and what are their plans? I think that will be at the core, won't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, in terms of who you want to, to, to do it, I mean, at the end of the day, um, I think you need somebody who has a... Uh, can be really objective and can understand for me the two things that I think are massively important. Uh, I think I think well I think I think he needs to look differently at the game and that's why I say take for example the um, the EFL's religious attempts to keep the championship within the EFL. If you then stood back and said, well, hang on a minute, um, can we get can we market a better competition? Can we market English football better? if we somehow took championship clubs, restructured the leagues and marketed that with the Premier League, got more money in, and then as long as we were confident that that was then shared properly and the funds flowed through the uh, the, 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 top, the whole pyramid, that you might have a different mindset. So I think somebody's got to be open to not being um, bullied by the, the, the lobbying that goes on to retain effectively what is the status quo. And that person has to be strong in that. And when you're looking at this this um, backstop thing, you 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 see that at some stage uh, the regulator will pull on independent experts if people can't agree, uh, and I think that's massively important that he has to understand who the people are and what skills are needed in doing that. So you know, there's lots of people who can do that who can be objective, but they have to be sensitive to two things. One is to protect the, the, the goose that lays the golden egg and be aware that the, the money coming in mm -hmm. has to be protected and can be protected and therefore needs to have some kind of sense of, you know, I wouldn't say to be a marketeer or to be, but to be able to appreciate what you could actually generate uh, in terms of um, the, the English game as a whole. And then secondly, it has to be able to understand what's necessary to retain the competitive element to the premier to the power the pyramid which is really to me first of all getting rid of these gaps and secondly doing all the good stuff like wages control um, financial reporting oadt etc and you know i'm sure this country is full of people who can do that uh, mark palios thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on this tonight uh, gavin and andrew staying with me till nine o'clock How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> Three, two, one. Uh, go, Browns. 
I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Andrew Mills and Gavin McGaw still with me uh, on uh, our hour tonight, looking at the football governance bill and the independent football regulator. Um, Andrew, I'd like to bring you in here, if I may, as well, at uh, this point, uh, along with... Gavin, just to say of, of what you've heard tonight so far as well, is it just that the Premier League really uh, won't like any of this, won't try to buy into any of this? Do you think this is going to cause a, a major problem? Well, I don't see. I don't see any drastic change i mean again there's been a trickle down effect of, of a number of uh, a, a number of changes over the last few years which is starting to have, starting to bite uh, the premier league a little um again i you know i want to be slightly thinking about it thinking outside the box I want to be slightly controversial where did the problem start the problem started when when the premier league cut itself adrift what happened the premier league cut itself adrift and therefore had no responsibilities to the success of the efl and every since that day, it, it's the EFL has had to dilute itself or its powers in 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 trying to kind of 
keep attached to the Premier League. You know, perhaps what they should be looking at is actually attaching a responsibility for a successful EFL to the Premier League. Mm. Make them responsible for that. If they aren't and, and can't do that, then again, what worries me is we 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 gloss over it. And I don't mean I don't mean you two gents. I mean myself and a number of the guests that have have been in these the, uh, these rooms gloss over the fact that the distribution of funds is as 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 Rick said, um, as Mark said, it's eighty percent. 80% to the championship, 12% to League One, 8% to League Two. Mm. The disparity in those numbers is absolutely ridiculous. That's the cause, the whole cause, for the problem that we have. Even if we had businesses being run correctly, there'd still be a disparity because the numbers are so significantly far away from each other. And that also tells you mm. what level of importance was put on the various divisions. And that shows us all we really need to know when it comes to these conversations. Um, Chris Forrier and his Leicester Till I Die, Leicester City Football Club. Good evening to you, Chris. Um, do join in the conversation here. I mean, Leicester City, of course, uh, somehow the club that managed um, to, to, to beat the, the so-called uh, top six in, uh, and win, as you did in that fantastic season, uh, the Premier League. But, of course, things beginning to once more go wrong and uh, finance being at the bottom of all of this. It is, and I've got to say, I've heard nothing tonight from any of the guests that have been on in the last hour that convinces me as a football fan that things are going to get any better. Um, nobody's bothered about us football fans. We all heard, oh, you know, when it was uh, COVID, or oh, we missed the fans, we missed the fans. You know, we got kickoffs at some unearthly time because somebody sold our soul to the TV companies. We've had Rick Parry. Honestly, I, have you ever heard as much BS as that? This is the guy when he was at Liverpool, set up the Premier League, set up a £700 million deal with, uh, with Sky to broadcast. And then he said that, there crying in his milk i mean <laughs> you know it should be you know we we have these owners come in we're being charged by the premier league we're being um charged by the efl it's all behind closed doors what are they scared of i would tell you know, if we if we've been done something wrong we'll pay mm. we will pay whatever it's points deduction if it's a fine if we've done you know been found to do something wrong that is fine what gets us annoyed as fans is the fact, the fact that these, these people don't tell us what's going on. We've said, let's do it publicly. Leicester City have said, we've had to now, you know, take the EFL and the Premier League, uh, take legal action against them. We're happy for it to be out as a club in the open, but no, you know, and that's, let's get this investigator in as soon as possible. Maybe he'll bring some clarity well, and maybe us as fans can actually understand what's going on. Well, let's, let's hope, oh, Chris, moment. let's hope, Chris, and you make some really good points there. Let's ask both Andrew and first Gavin. Well, your response to Chris. I, I think Chris makes a lot of great points there, um, Chris. But what I would say, um, we're talking here about a regulator. We're talking here about Leicester City. And Leicester City signed up to rules. And as Chris said, if they've, got it wrong if they've overreached it they need to pay up for those rules and that's why there's an independent uh, person in charge of the commission overseeing it which is taking the time and it's not good for chris but if it wasn't then we would have even more problems and just go back to what andrew was saying earlier about where this all started with the regulator i don't think it started actually over premier league efl distributions it started when barry went under mark uh, and that led to problems in Downing Street where they got frustrated with the idea of Bury, a uh, little football team, going out of business and how that was wrong whenever the Premier League had so much money, misunderstanding that it was the actions of a very bad owner. Now, if you look at what's happening in Leicester, Leicester aren't going to go out of business. They have, in effect, had a... Uh, they're getting sanctioned for falling outside the rules that they agreed to, but they're no, not no, going no, out sorry. of business. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on there. Uh, Gavin, finish. Uh, so, so, so I think that's a different thing, and I think it is though positive that we're now catching up with teams who are, don't reach the profit and sustainability rules. It will take time, but it, that provides some sustainability. But Barry and the reason this whole regulator is in place are completely different to my mind. Chris. Can I just come back and say we didn't sign up for this? These we've been. You did. You remember the. the you remember the Premier League. You remember the Premier League. You when you signed this up for this, got, you this sat right and you agreed the rules. You agreed no, your post this you season. 
This was pushed through this season, this uh, extra fast tracking clubs. We're not in the Premier League this season. You may have you noticed signed up to the rules about losses in the Premier League. And I, yeah, but I we didn't sign up to this fast track. And we are being charged. We are being charged because we've not produced our accounts. Well, according to the, the, the new rules, we don't have to. We did not sign up to those uh, super fast rules. And if this is the case, What's happening with Manchester City? What's happening with Chelsea? Why are Everton, Nottingham Forest, Leicester, and who knows what other small clubs being picked on? It's bully boy tactics by the EFL, by the um, uh, by Premier the Premier League. League. Chris, we're, I mean, there are great. Andrew, come in here and 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 add to this. I'm 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 uh, enjoying the spectacle. Um, <laughs> only because I think again, what you know, what Chris is doing. Chris is Chris is raising his honest concerns with the manner and the way which this is all communicated. What Gavin is trying to do, Chris, is suggest that as unpalatable as it now is, they, there would have been a block of rules and regulations that all member clubs would have understood and would have known. However, there has absolutely been a change in how they're dealt with. There's a change in the severity and the speed. But I, I don't think this is behind the reasoning mm -hmm. and uh, behind the reasoning to, to Leicester being charged. Now, you have absolutely got a point. And, and Mark, Gavin and I have made this point several times in terms of Chelsea, in terms of Manchester City. Because yeah. if I was sitting there as a Leicester fan, I'd feel exactly, exactly. the same. I would, I would want to be, and um, to be, to be being Gavin, charged by exactly the same rule book. Gavin, and Forrest, I just, I either. So, Gavin, just very quickly, how quickly we, we're under a minute here now? How quickly can this happen? That that often depends, Mark, on the club and what they're willing to put forward. We, we're seeing the Forest thing happen a lot quicker than the original Everton thing, which has led to a less severe penalty for Forest. But undoubtedly, they'll want to do this well ahead of the June date of the Premier League AGM, so they'll know who's coming in and, and then what punishments are in place. And secondly, when do we see a regulator in control? Oh, I think that'll take some time. So I think certainly by the end of the year, we'll see a lot more firm action on that appointment of a chief exec, probably in the next probably three months. Gavin, thank you. Andrew, thank you. Chris Forian, thank you very much indeed on behalf of Leicester City Football Club. We're talking Grand Prix and much more next. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such is the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Well, we've had a terrific couple of hours so far. I'm just at this point to say, don't forget, back at the stand, our podcast tomorrow with all the big highlights from tonight's show. And on Wednesday, uh, we will be looking at detail uh, on our big discussion in the middle hour there about the football regulator as well. So uh, whether it's Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your uh, podcasts for, don't miss back of the stand. Uh, download it as soon as it's available tomorrow. Um, the referees are just a little bit later. They're usually stuck in the middle uh, with us with all sorts of things to say. But Mark Halsey and, of course, Keith Hackett uh, with me right now. Gentlemen, very good evening to you. Of course, if, as the independent regulator and the, the, the Premier League and the football, they've, they've forgotten about the refereeing side of things. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe they'll have a look at refereeing, Mark, and uh, improve what we're seeing at the moment. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think they should do, Mark, don't you? Uh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we've seen during the week that uh, John John Moss has left his role as the uh, select group manager, director, whatever his title is, and uh, I think that can only be good, to be fair. Well, to be fair, Keith, um, I, I don't mean this really, but it's a bit of a gag. I, I wish I could get rid of my Moss in my front garden as quickly as they've got rid of him, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day... Uh, they, the Premier League, decided that the PGMOL was failing uh, and Mike Riley, Riley was asked to pack his bags and, and depart. What I think they failed to do was help Howard by removing the middle management, i.e. John Moss and others that are still there, uh, and particularly the coaching staff. And I think this is where it, it's all gone a bit pear-shaped. I think Howard has inherited a poor bunch now he's got to put it right. And look, I think when he does that television program, Mark, he's got to be a bit better at it because I think trying to defend that challenge mm. in the Liverpool game was an absolute nonsense. It doesn't come across well yeah. for him or for the PGMOL referees. Do you, do you know what? I mean, and I'm going to talk as a fan here now. Uh, and, and a lot of the fans that we speak to, and, and, and you'll know this too, I think that the referee 
bodies and the referees have got to get away from this smugness that they seem to have both on the field and off it at the moment. We don't want our referees to be like that. We've had that. We've had great characters. You'll know them only too well. We've had referees yeah. that, but they they feel they used to feel real and not vulnerable. But you know, we were with them much more than perhaps we are these days. Because every single referee I see at the moment lower down in the football league, I just think, oh, you can tell within the first minute and a half, it's more about him than the game. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. manufactured, Mark. Yeah, they're manufactured. Uh, yeah. So come on then, let's talk more about that. Keith, you first, uh, then you, Mark. Well, I think that, you know, one of the great things, and, and you know, I, I run the line for people like Jack Taylor, Harold Lackney, Pat Partridge, George Courtney. They all had strong personalities. I mean, mm. Neil Midgley would crack jokes on the pitch and you'd see the players smiling. Mark Elsey had personality, and I think we've lost that side of refereeing that's so important mm. winning the respect of players understanding that we are entering their area of operation we're entering their workplace and i think we've just got to be a bit more sympathetic to the game and to actually manage the players manage them effectively but with a bit of a smile i mean mm. I, I, they are manufactured and they're all clones and I, and I think we've got to get away from that. We've well, got to get back to the personality. Uh, rigid. The rigidness yeah. for me is getting in the way, Mark. Yeah, keep spot on. I think I think what we've seen what we've seen at pre, up to present day is that the PG, PGL management have lost the dressing room. That's what it seems to me. And it's like when a manager loses the dressing room, he loses the players. And I think he's lost his his, his top referees. Um, and. It's that arrogance that they're showing on the field of play at the moment. And mm. like, like, like you say, we've got to show empathy with the game. It's not always about the laws of the game. It's about knowing the game of football mm. and, and, and bringing that smile back. It's not about the referees. It's about the players and the fans. Go out there and enjoy it. Go out there and smile. Engage with the players and, yeah. and, and have a little bit of empathy for the game, a little bit of common sense. But that comes from the leadership and direction from the management. That's what's lacking. And you can referee in that manner. Ref, referee, yeah. Referees have been in, employed in the game for many, many years. Refereeing hasn't changed. Refereeing hasn't changed from 100 years ago to today. All what has changed is the pace of the game and the challenges. But the, 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 the main feature of, of refereeing hasn't changed. No, and the, I think, you know, uh, Mark, if I can come in, I, yeah. I, I think that one of the things that's such a negative in the game is that we know that Howard said we're going to clamp down. But we see referees just showing a yellow card with absolutely no management within that process. No sort of, hey, come on, I've got to show you this. Or even the step before, that one where that could have been a yellow card, let's go on the player's side and then yeah. run alongside the player and say, I've seen enough now. Just uh, I want an improvement in your behaviour. Mm -hmm. I think it's just part of the process that, Mark and I and many other referees of our generation were brought up with, and that is communication is so important. But I think that we're locked <clears throat> into paperwork. We've got to ha tick this box, tick the other box, and what we've got is this is what manufactured refereeing is. Oh. Am I doing this right? And it's a selfish well, approach. I think that, that, that really good points you both made there. I just want to add to this and, and get your thoughts on this as well. I think there was that... David Ellery and all the bits and pieces that the, the Harrow schoolmaster did and uh, whatever else there was, and, and then with Mike Riley. And I, I remember very early on listening to, to Mike Riley when uh, Amazon Prime, I was working for them as a reporter, and the ref, referees came along to speak. And it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't real. And freedom, personality and respect are three things that the referees that I watched when you guys were, were refereeing, were key. And I think that people are looking at the modern referee and thinking, I don't want to be like that. Is there yeah. still an opportunity for me to come in and, and, and show what I can do as a referee rather than being launched at the whole time because I've become, they've taken away the reality of being a referee, if you see what I mean. They no longer, yeah, I think uh, it, the I, human I, bit has gone, I, and that's so wrong, yeah. Keith. Yeah, there's, there's, 
they're locked in a system, Mark. They're locked in the words that they're professional, so they've got to perform. But, you know, I, you know, Mark and I, we've been on the pitch with some great players, you know, and those players would tell us if we were going a bit wayward, yeah, they'd run alongside us and say, we've seen too much of you, Keith. Come off, come off it, you know. And, and I think that working relationship that we enjoyed is mirrored to some degree in, in how we've won the respect of players. The older players now have retired from the game. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I look back. I mean, this week we had the unfortunate passing of Stan Bowles. What a character. Mm. And, and you could have a fight with him on the pitch, literally, verbally. But a few <laughs> you, you were you would just admired his skill set and his personality. Mm. I don't know whether players have changed, and you know certainly there was a period when, if you remember, there was those claims against Mark Clattenburg on racial aspects with Chelsea. There was the Graham Powell scenario, and and these have put referees or made them slightly defensive from actually chatting to the players mm. and recognising, look, how lucky are we that we're on the same field as those players. And uh, it, you've made both made this point, and there was much more about it in the last week here, that referees are thinking more of what the assessor in the stands is thinking they're doing than actually getting on and refereeing the game in front of them. Is that fair? Well, well they've now think... got coaches. They've got coaches, Mark, in the stand that, that have, a, have an iPad. And they tick the boxes. The the reality is, this is why it's it's become almost like uh, I, I've been doing school school teachers a disservice because they do exert some personality. I I think it's just lacking in terms of look. This is a sport. This is a sport that we all want to enjoy. We're very lucky when we get to the elite level to be on the same pitch as these players. Enjoy it, but they don't seem to be enjoying it either, no. Mark. No. Yeah. To be fair, Keith, I feel sorry for the guys because they go to they go and referee a football match, okay, and then they, they'll have a, a key match incident, say a penalty incident, where the referee gives a penalty. He will give the penalty. The coach and assessor agree, but the the review panel don't agree, and they say they've got it wrong. So where? So what? So the referee? What? What, what does he do? Does he does he give the penalty? Does he not give a penalty next week? So I, I I feel sorry for him, and you're right with these these iPads. The iPad gives them the mark, and listen, uh, it, respect comes with the accuracy of your decision making and the way you talk and treat the players as well. Of course, the other so the, the other thing guys. that has happened with this generation of uh, referees, of course, is that social social media has exploded um, in so many different forms, where people just say what. Uh, what they like. Half these people have never even seen the referee that they're then moaning mm. on about and what have you. Yeah. There is a real problem with all of this, I think, in the way the game goes. But what we need to see, and, and it's always in everything we've discussed tonight, it's about leadership. If you yes. get the leadership right, yeah. you have a yeah. little bit of humour, you have your personality, you know what's wrong. I mean, a lot, most of the footballers... Um, uh, no, and certainly most of the supporters that have been going for years know the difference yeah. between a decent ref and a fraud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've walked across Stanley Park uh, chatting to supporters, going towards the ground, and you may have made a mistake in a big game and you come out of that stadium and you walk across Stanley Park and you might get chatting to individuals, asking you to explain the decision. But it's it's all now, these guys arrive in a van, they get out of the van, there's no communication. And it's a little bit like players the same way, they come with the, the headphones on. I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I get heavily involved in social media, Mark, yeah. because I think I need to educate some of the guys. You know, and you get into a conversation and you perhaps outline the law without getting into too much detail, but actually give a referee side of it. We don't even see that. We don't understand, do we? The, the guy's got to carry, he's got to run 11,500 metres a game. He's got to be fit, mobile. And the chances are, with the big decisions, he's not seeing it. 
because he's not he's not arrived at the place to see it and recognise yeah. the angle. Do you think, Mark, that the, the referees have become detached from the players and the players' personalities? I think you touched. I think you touched on it, Mark. I think when you said that it comes from the leadership and the direction from from the management. And I mean, when keepers in charge, you always give us that opportunity to. To, to speak to speak with you know with the with the managers you know you know if we needed to speak with them if we needed to pick up the phone and speak with them on a Monday or Tuesday we did and I couldn't see nothing wrong with that no, um, no. I mean that that went away as soon as Mike Riley took took to control because I remember Mark Clattenburg had a conversation I had a conversation with a manager and we were both got suspended people and we all got suspended for talking to managers on the telephone so I, I think that you know we're, we're all we're all in this together we're all we're all a family we're all a family. And we should not be separated, and that's and that, you're right. We're, we're we're just gradually drifting apart from each other. We're all in this together. Well, I've not. You see, I I find it difficult at times, Keith, to understand now because I know that VAR comes from a bunker, but there's a complete bunker mentality of refereeing these days. That as if everything's against them. Well, th they're not no. showing the freedom to be able to do their job either. Well, there's no doubt that I think VAR has suppressed their decision-making process. Yeah. I think it's it's hindered them. Yeah. I, there's no question, and and I and and we're seeing them. I think being encouraged to capitulate their decision, their thoughts to the man at Stockley Park, yeah. and I and this is where I think it's wrong. I think that you know I've operated with assistant referees. It's it's no different that they're there at the side of the field. I've made a decision and they think the flag's gone up, it's offside. We've had a communication and, and we've come hopefully to the right decision. I think that um, the way VAR is operating is debilitating to them. I think the management style that's been in operation for a number of years has affected the quality of the personality of our referees. We've lost our world number one status. Yeah. And one of the and other I, I things, think, and this is and they're just from both of you on this, because this is an important point <laughs> in the last three minutes we've got or so. I'll come to you first, Mark, if I may. We're now entering after this international break, uh, the, sort of the key part of the season. And if the season that we've had so far in the Premier League with VAR and some of the other poor refereeing we've seen in some of the other leagues, I'm not saying everything is by any means, but this is when I fear that referees who haven't got it right so far, under extra pressure, who knows what we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. Well, well, listen, Sags, I think, you know, and you're right. We're coming to the business end of the season. There's there's lots at stake at the top of the league, at the bottom of the league, every, every league, not just in the professional leagues, in, in, mm. in non-league as mm. well. Um, so uh, you've got to put your best referees out week in week out if that means some of the other guys not getting a game then so be it so be it you've yeah. got to put your best guys out all the time the guys that are performing the guys that you know i mean keith when keith was in charge he knew what referees he could trust what referees yeah. he could put on what game and that's and that's what and that's what, that, what howard's got to do now but it, i think with howard stepping back into the cold face taking charge from john moss i think we may see a, an improvement in in standards of, of refereeing and communication and the way they go because, out of refereeing games. Keith, when you were looking after all these referees, you made it your job to know who was in form and who wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had the sports science, I had people. But the one thing I had, Mark, I had half a dozen top quality coaches who spoke honestly. If, they, if I was going offline and they thought I was making a wrong call, they covered my bike. Make no mistake. And I think this is where Riley made his big mistake. He got rid of the Durkins, the Howells, the, the, the Roger Dilks, Trevor Simpson, and all those, those excellent coaches that had good rapport with the referees. Uh, and in fact, were, were a balance against either me coming in heavy on a, a poor decision mm. or them coming under pressure from the media. And I think all that sort of dissipated when Riley made his changes. Absolutely, the coming weeks are important. And I just used to look at the referees who were in form, the ones that gave me the least amount of trouble, they got the games. And, and they actually pulled the others through because I would say to the others who come moaning, 
I why haven't I got a game? And I just say, well, you're out of form, mate. You better work harder on the training field. Keith, Mark, brilliant as always. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's our very latest from the referees. They'll be back, of course, uh, together next week after what will be an extraordinary weekend of action to come as all of the leagues return. We've still got tennis and we've still got motor racing to talk about here before Howard Hughes at 10 o'clock. Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Time for us to talk tennis and uh, really uh, getting uh, into the season now. The Miami Open, of course, a terrific event going on uh, right the way through to the end of March. And, um, well, they've had rain delays and everything, but a, a bit like the uh, golf that's uh, still going on tonight as well, the Valspar 
uh, also uh, in uh, Florida. Barry Cowan, of course, uh, very much part of this show when it comes to tennis, former British tennis player, is with us. And Rob Malarkey, a WTA commentator. Great to have you with us, Rob, too. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, good first evening, both of you. Yeah, no, good evening to both of you, too. Um, and now Ali Murray won the first set, didn't he? But he's, uh, he's down 5-4 uh, in the second. Um, but um, it, hopefully, as he's serving, uh, as he is right now, that um, he'll get back into this again and uh, continue his ways. First of all, let's talk a little bit about Andy Murray. It, for me, it's extraordinary that here he is still going on, Rob. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, I, I, I was harking back to the time when he was at the Australian Open a few years ago when um, Mark Petchy was interviewing him on court, and it was almost like bidding farewell, wasn't he? <laughs> there was this unofficial announcement, and people misconstrued something he'd said in a press conference, and they did this montage of his career, and it, it all looked to be, um, you know, was, uh, the suggestion was that was that, but you know, Murray just keeps on going. He's of course had this hip operation. He's a brilliant advert for hip surgery, by the way. This replacement hip that he's had, yeah. and um, earlier this year, not too long ago, he suggested or hinted that you know this could be his last year. And there was that incident earlier this season where he said on court, "I can't do this anymore." But you never know with Murray when he's on court. There was a lot of history on it going on there as well, and I, I just think that yeah, if this is to be his last season, then then. <laughs> It, it, it'll be a shame because you know he'll, he'll have a tournament like this where it might just make him think again anyway. And if he goes deep in Miami, and let's face it, he's in a very well, he's in the kinder half of the draw. I think yeah. Barry will agree with that as well. Uh, and who knows if he goes fourth round quarterfinals, he might just think again, especially if he has a good summer as well. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more, uh, Barry, and, and obviously with you, Rob, too. That how difficult is it? I mean, I don't individual sportsmen and women for me. It's up to them when they decide they've had enough even if they don't play to the level they before but they they somehow still still need this within in their life and i don't see a problem with that do you well i think the problem that that andy had that if we go back to 2017 was when the hip first when he first had problems with the hip in the summer of 2017 he was world number one mm. so then his 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 whole career was halted where physically he, he wasn't able to play at that high level, but mentally he still believes he's world number one. And it's that stubbornness and it's that, that, that willingness to that want to prove people wrong. He doesn't want to stop this year. And if he wins matches, I don't believe he will stop because I think he has that mindset that, as, as Rob said, oh, well, I won the quarterfinals here. Oh, well, the next time I, I can maybe go to the semifinals. Or the other week he lost in, in Doha, he lost to Mensit, the young Czech player, in a close match in three sets. He then made the final. He's, well, that could have been me. And, that, and that's how Murray Murray thinks. And and the draw has opened up. Mm. I, I actually think the rain delay was, was one that actually was bad timing for Murray because he was well on the way. I, I felt the momentum was with him. And so often, as we know, being being Brits, um, it can cause havoc with what well, it used to cause havoc with matches at Wimbledon. But yeah, hopefully mm. Murray can get the job done in straight sets. Well, he's forty fifteen down at the moment, uh, serving to uh, stay in this set. I'll keep you up to date um, with that. It's not easy to multitask, Mark. No, I'm watching. I'm, I'm, I've got half an eye on this screen, half an eye on the uh, Murray yeah. match against uh, Makach over here as well. So. It doesn't matter. It's good. Uh, Let's keep. We'll, we'll keep it. Yeah. Keep it going with all of that. I mean, you know, while the while the appetite is there as well. I mean, what are we thinking about? It, it, would he? Th it, is he said anything about the Olympics? Does he get that opportunity, or does that just not happen? How does that work? Well, I think well, he. he Sorry, sorry, Rob. Sorry, sorry, Rob. Rob first. No, I was just going to say he's, he's he's clearly got a love affair with the Olympics, given everything that he achieved in 2012, and um, he suggested that you know he would like to play in Paris this summer. Uh, the the opportunities, the openings are there uh, in terms of um, either singles or maybe even the, the, the I think the doubles might be a better bet for him, mm. um, given his potential schedule. I, mean, I think much depends on how he fares on the grass court season, and then of course he'll have a decision to make maybe on on the basis of that, Barry. Yeah, I think mixed doubles is a great shout. Uh, it's a 16 draw. And if Raducanu can get fit, well, that I mean, the mixed doubles was obviously won back in at Wimbledon in 2012 that he won a, a medal with Laura Robson. I, I think that's a realistic shot. I mean, when you're playing doubles or mixed doubles, you want a good partner. Mm. Uh, and Raducanu would definitely be a good partner if, if he decided to go that route as well. Yeah, you, before we talk more about her and one or two of the others, what about Nori as well? He's through, isn't he, at this stage, playing later on, I think is, it, it would be tonight. Um, 
against Medvedev, of course, another great test. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a bad matchup, I feel, uh, for for Cam. He's played him twice. He's lost twice comfortably. But, um, you know, Medvedev, again, is, he's been in fantastic form. And I, I think for Medvedev, obviously, the heartache of getting so close in Australia, he was within a whisker of, of winning that match. Lost another one, uh, Australian Open final, having been two sets to love up. And, you know, Medvedev is the master at making life very difficult for his opponents and making the opponents play poorly. Um, but, you know, Norrie is is always one, you know, that don't you don't often win that uh, that physical battle with Norrie. Uh, and that's always the key if you are playing Medvedev. Mm. So the how... trouble, uh, sorry, I was going to say the trouble with Norrie as well is that not long ago he was on the verge of the top 10. Now he's yeah. very close to dropping out of the top 32. And when that happens, of course, that's when you lose his seeding at the Grand Slams and that can have a really big impact. So then questions will be asked of how he can bounce back from that and, and go again. And of course, he's got you know, the likes of Jack Draper uh, breathing down his neck mm -hmm. in terms of the British number one status as well. So, yeah, no, just that's something else. an important point. I can tell you that it's uh, it's juice now. So once more, R Murray with a smile on his face, Rob, there. Um, <laughs> still, uh, still looking as if he's uh, hanging on in there at this moment. I think Barry might agree, but I think Murray needs to discover the art or try and master the art of winning in two sets as well. I think that might have a big impact on the rest of his career this year as well. If if he could suddenly master the formula of winning two set matches rather than having these lengthy three set encounters, five set encounters, of course, in the slams as well, as we saw in Australia, uh, I think that would do in the world. I'll good. tell you what, I've just watched him move around the court and finish with a fantastic smash to go advantage here to, to bring it back to five all with the old right hand fist pump. Um, Barry, the, the, the appetite is still there. And while he's got that, he's got to continue. He's not going to lose that. And it's absolutely his right to, to decide what he wants to do. I mean, I, I, I always I find it incredible that athletes like that. He's never going to get back to where he was. He's never, yeah. in my opinion, he's never going to win majors. But that's not the real. Well, he probably thinks he is. But but his, you know, he wants to get out there and compete. And he still has the desire. and everything you know just click and, and happen you have to put in the hard yards and and no no stone has he's left no stone unturned in his rehab in the last five or six years that that's where my you know even more admiration towards murray has been mm. Can I just... and he's still yeah, he's sorry, still please. beating he's still beating good players as well let's not mm. lose sight of that i mean ed chaveri yesterday is a, is a top 30 player um, Berrettini, not too long ago, was a Wimbledon finalist, beat him recently. I know he's coming back from various issues. Uh, you know, and Tomas Makash, who is playing tonight, you know, he's, he beat Murray earlier this year in Marseille. Mm -hmm. So Murray is still challenging against respectably high players in the world rankings. I don't think he's capable of beating Alcaraz or, you know, mm -hmm. Djokovic week in, week out. But I think that, that level, I think there is a level that Murray could aspire to. And if he gets lucky with a few draws here and there, that can, that can certainly enhance his uh, credentials. I think that's the key. The stars need to be aligned. He needs to get the good draw. He needs to get players. You know, as Rob said, uh, Berrettini hasn't played. Uh, also, Echeverri, who played in the second round, had a bye. Has also, also been injured for the last five or six weeks. So he needs those type of things to go his way. I, I don't see him at this stage of his career being able to go three rounds in a row beating top 30 players. Mm. Um, but, you know, tennis tennis is now is not what it was six, seven years ago, you're not going to necessarily get the top eight always in the final eight. You will get surprises along the way. Rob, with your commentator's hat on here as well, now we we, mm. we, we slightly mentioned uh, Raducanu there. Um, uh, where do you feel she now is again? It's difficult to say sometimes, really. I mean, she had to pull out of Miami with a, a lower back injury. I've, I've lost count of the number of injuries mm. that she had, especially over the course of last year. Her management team say it's nothing serious. I think it is a, a self-preservation exercise, but she's had that before as well, mm. where she has taken precautions. But of course, time off the court is detrimental in its own way as well. So suddenly she's got to pick up the pieces of this hardcore season that she's had in, in Asia and now in North America to an extent. She had a, a you know, reasonable run in Indian Wells, I thought, you know, shots to the third round, but the trouble mm. was she, she, she needed to protect four round points from last year so despite going far relatively given what she's done lately 
she actually dropped quite a significant number of places in the rankings because of the the fact that she couldn't protect from uh, the points that she picked up last year. So she's got this problem now where she's been on the hard course in Asia, in America. Now she's got to pick up the pieces of not having played in Miami and then move on to the the clay court season. Mm -hmm. And that can be a really significant... I mean, clay court tennis is a a brutal, horrible, (laughs) tough environment at the best of times. And, And when you've not got a great amount of match competitive match practice under your belt uh, going into that clay court season which is very very long as well um i, th- I think it can be mm-hmm. it could or it could be a, a, bit, a bit of an issue for her um but the, the on the plus side she's not protecting many points now for, for the rest of the year she's got first round points in Miami. they've gone of course uh first round points in stuttgart from last year but apart from that she's got a free roll of the dice she's playing with the house money for the rest of the season effectively so mm-hmm. it's a good chance to um, I mean, no doubt she'll get wild cards for Wimbledon and a lot of the grass court tournaments as well. And um, no doubt she'll try and seize the opportunity to, like I say, play with the house money and just pick up ranking points where she can, get the ranking a bit more respectable and just get some game time, competitive game time under her belt because that's ultimately what she needs. Yeah, Barry, it's um, it's a, a difficult story at times, this one, isn't it, as well? But where are we placed with um, British women at the moment? And, and for both of you, I'm going to ask this question, how much is now that... Skies have decided with this 24-hour uh, tennis channel now that's really going to inspire, I think, youngsters in this country again. Well, can I start with Katie Bolter? What a yeah. great story. She's yeah. playing some incredible tennis. She, she just won a title in, in San Diego. Yeah. She had a great win last night against Beatrice Haddad Meyer. She plays as a ranker in the next round. And if we're, if we're looking at a tennis player, a women, female tennis player right now in terms of ball striking, she is right up there actually um she's now up to uh, 20 26 in the world i think is a is a her live ranking as as things stand uh, and and if everything clicks and it's starting to click more and more with katie i, I felt mm-hmm. that last year when i watched her play some of the matches that she's always had the ball striking ability but, she, but at times she wasn't able to deal with those off days and in tennis you get a load of off days you've got to deal with 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 issues and, and problems on the court. And, and I feel her problem solving has improved so much. Her mindset has improved. I think it's, it's undoubtedly helped her relationship with Alex de Menor. I mean, you've got two contrasting <laughs> tennis players there, but they both helped each other. He's having the year of his life. So I think for, for Katie, she's someone who I think could have a phenomenal grass court mm-hmm. season. I really do feel that she can, she can really do some damage on the grass. I, I think for Raducanu, the ranking for me is totally irrelevant right now. I, I, I've seen her play some good matches. I thought she played well against um, Zabalenka in Indian Wells, but I don't think we really learnt a whole lot there. We know she can play well on the big stage. I just feel for, for, for Emma, one way or another, she's got to get playing matches and winning matches. She's only won five matches this year and we're nearly at the end of March. And that's kind of my worry because if she can win some matches, for, let's kind of forget the clay court season. It's not about yeah. making sure you get the clay court season. It's about getting matches. If you can get enough wins going into the grass court season, then the momentum can, can can carry you through. But I think it's tough if we're sort of asking this question in three months' time and she's only won another five matches. Mm. Um, your thoughts, Rob? Uh, well, firstly, on Bolter, I think, yeah, I mean, what a year she's had. I think it all, well, it's, you can take it back, I suppose, immediately to the title that she had in Nottingham last year. I think the Davis, uh, sorry, the Billie Jean King Cup has brought out some good stuff in her as well. I, I read an interview with her, or saw an interview with her late last year, where she was talking about this relationship with her coach, um, Biliana Veselinovic, and she was talking about how much her serve has improved, and I think that's really noticeable as well. Mm-hmm. I commentated on Bolter's match against Anna Bogdan in um, Adelaide earlier this yeah. year. Bogdan won that match, but Bolter played really well. I, 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 I thought, well, that's just early season cobwebs, maybe. But she, again, she hit tons of, well, not seemingly tons of backhand winners that day. The backhand winner down the line was a real weapon for her. So she's clearly worked on a few things. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Mm. As Barry said, I think, I think the relationship with Dimonor has, has, has made her smile a lot. You know, she's, she seems very, very happy. But I think the relationship with her coach is just as important as well. And, and Barry talked earlier about the stars aligning. I think that's coming to the fore now a little bit as well with her draw. She's in this fairly kind quarter now that mm. um, Sabalenka's um, been knocked out and now that um, Zhang Xinwen has been eliminated as well. Azarenka's going to be tough. I mean, she's 34, but she's you know she's a former world number one, two-time Australian Open champion. But you know, looking ahead, she you know it's not beyond the possibilities that she could get to a quarterfinal. Um, and, and and again, talking about the ranking, she. 
isn't protecting anything from last year. So she's got, again, mm -hmm. she's got a free hit here. So whatever she picks up is absolutely tremendous. And of course, financially, it's just such a reassurance for her now because not so long ago, she was, you know, looking around maybe for a sponsor here and there, and she was looking about how to finance, um, you know, this existence on, on the global stage, this, this global tour. Um, but now, I mean, looking at what she's got, she's got $101,000 guaranteed for this, maybe 185000 if she beats Azarenka. You know, that, that yeah. when that takes care of itself, that can make a real difference to not just tennis players, but any individual sportsman where you are f trying to find the funding and the backing and are trying to att attract sponsors yeah. as well. And, That's you know, she's at a good stage of it. You know, she's 20, what, 26, 27? So I think she's at a really good stage now. Mm. Uh, and I'm, yeah, like Barry said, I'm, I'm genuinely excited about what she could do this summer, uh, this year. Rob? Barry, thank you very much indeed. I'm sure we're going to speak again pretty soon. Um, that's the very latest on the Miami Open, except to tell you that uh, at the moment, uh, Murray uh, serving to force the second set into a tie break, and he is uh, 30 or 6 5 down at the moment. We're going to look back at the Australian Grand Prix with Tony Jardine to round off the show tonight. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> All this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs> Three, two, one. Uh, go Browns. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It's time for us to uh, finish the programme with uh, what is an extraordinary Australian Grand Prix. Um, Tony Jardine is with us right now. Look, uh, so much to talk about here. I want to start, obviously, with uh, the Ferrari 1-2 with Carlos Sainz winning after Verstappen um, uh, didn't even finish. And then we'll come on and talk, and thank goodness George Russell is OK, about what happened there towards the end, Tony. But let, let, let's start with this Ferrari 1-2. Uh, it's fabulous. It's refreshing. Uh, it shows that Red Bull can be beaten, that they're fallible, that there is a god upstairs after two years of <laughs> utter domination. I think it's fabulous. The only thing that I can counter on that is that it is a very flat street circuit where the aerodynamics do not come into play. Mm. The next race in Japan, that's really aerodynamic. We'll really test the chassis. That aside, do not take it away from Ferrari because they've been getting closer. They're doing a fantastic job. And I think, you know, the world watching Carlos Sainz just two weeks after his appendicitis and being rushed into hospital in Saudi Arabia to make that sort of comeback and lead home his teammate, Charles Leclerc, who's the favoured one, let's be honest, uh, to score his third win. And I think it's only there, Ferrari's fifth one too, in something like 10 or 12 years. So... It's quite a feat. I mean, absolutely. And, and the fans in Melbourne rose to him with that, didn't they? You, you noticed that as well, because you could hear the noise of the crowd above the engines. There was 132,000 spectators out. I mean, look, it's always been popular. We, all, we used to go down to Adelaide and that was big. But when it came up to Melbourne you know, and Melbourne managed to get the Grand Prix away from Adelaide, uh, the, the fan base there is incredible. And, and you're seeing the pictures and the build-up to the race. The drivers, it takes them about 40 minutes to get into the paddock. They have to sign so many autographs, mm. and they're like 10, 12 deep. So it's fantastic. I, I remember we used to arrive with Murray Walker and, and Murray, Murray's fan club in Australia, because they love uh, you know, Formula 1 so, so much, was amazing. They were all waiting for him at the airport. They'd wait for the drivers. So, fantastic atmosphere in Albert yeah. Park, and they love a Ferrari. They really do. It's a cosmopolitan crowd, and as I've said to you on this program before, Ferrari has this connection, this warmth. It's not just in the colour. It's just such a huge, huge brand. It, it's mm. like the Manchester United fans around the world, really, and, and the following is enormous and in places that you would never, ever think of. So, I think this, this is great. Mm. And it's it's good for Carlos Sainz, you know, what he's in the shop window, he's looking for a job. Well, I mean, it, it, exactly that. I mean, nine days after uh, being in hospital, he wasn't sure. He said his body's all over the place. He's not sure which bits are they're, you know, running differently to not. And of course, yeah, as you mentioned there, you know, Lewis Hamilton to come in in, in uh, 25. And, um, you, you know, what could be better than this for him? It's I mean, it's perfect. Um, Carlos Sainz has been underestimated over many years because he started in the junior formula together with Max Verstappen. They were in Toro Rosso together. And you know, Mac, Max is head and shoulders above, it, above everybody else, mm. of course. But Carlos Sainz, like his dad, who's double world rally champion and, and won Dakar, by the way, his dad won Dakar age 65 in January this year. And... <laughs> Yeah, Carlos went out to see him as well. But he's got he's got the mentality of his dad. He's got the technical knowledge of his dad. He's got the determination. And he's definitely got the fitness. Because mm. to drive an aerodynamic car like that just two weeks after that operation and get through it, he said, look, it was kind to me because once I got out front and I could control the race and look after the tyres, then I didn't have to put my body through that much stress. But there were lots of jokes afterwards, you know, 
maybe maybe other drivers should have their appendix removed and lose some weight. You know. So. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, he'll, uh, he might be sweating a little bit, uh, George Russell, because when you get stuck in the middle of the track like that, you just don't know what's going to happen, do you? Do you know what? It was very reminiscent in 1990 of Derek Warwick when I was working on the Lotus team, and he lost it coming out of the last corner onto that immense straight down in Monza, mm. and he's flipped, and he was upside down in the car with cars going either side of him. And literally when they got him out, he sprinted back and got to the spare car and the doctor looked to him and off he went. I spoke to him after his wife. He said, as soon as I could hear that the racing engines had stopped, I knew it's time to get out because he was okay. Mm. But what you heard George saying was, it's a red, it's a red, it's a red. He was asking them to red flag the race and they didn't. And no. racing cars were still going left and right of him. Someone came around that blind corner a little bit quick and could have hit, hit him. Having survived the accident, he could yeah. have been hit by another racing car. So I thought that was really dangerous and a bad move by race control. What happened with uh, Fernando Alonso at that point with this 20-second penalty then? They, they didn't actually touch, did they? No, no. But I, I, look, first of all, you know you know what Alonso is like. You know, 42 <laughs> years of age, this is a wily old fox. He's on older tyres. George has come out on the new tyres. George is closing in on him. And George is, is there for two laps trying to get past him. And Alonso's trying everything. Now, mm. I might be wrong here, but I think I know what Alonso was doing. The stewards know what he was doing. And that is, he just slowed sufficiently to put George off mm. coming into that bend. George then was right under the gearbox of Fernando, lost the aerodynamics. And you see from the inboard camera, the front of the car goes like that. Next minute, he's off. Unfortunately, where he hit the wall and the wheel tucked in underneath the car, but it was held on by its tether and flipped it onto its side, but not over. So what Alonso did was come off. The, he, he braked slightly earlier. He came off the throttle slightly earlier. And he said he was trying a different line. He wanted to get a better exit out of the corner. That's what he told the stewards. But the stewards had all the telemetry and they could see that on that, corner on that lap he did everything totally differently so they said mm -hmm. that's dangerous driving they gave him a 20 second penalty he dropped from six to eight it's it's not actually much of a punishment to be very honest but um that's typical alonzo you know yeah. his elbows out i'll put him off you know <laughs> and but, what about lewis hamilton i mean it's his worst start to a grand prix season for ever basically well, certainly Great. a long time yeah I'm, I'm, when we were talking about Saudi Arabia, it's two years since since he's won. Mm. And the guy's perfectly capable of winning races, but the car was all over the place. You could see from the onboard cameras, it was, first of all, the back was coming out of the car, then the front was coming out of the car. As soon as the wind gets up, the aerodynamics on that car are very, very sensitive, and you're starting to lose a little bit of control. But that's the first time that he's not made the third qualifying session mm. in, I think it's 11 seasons, mm. you know, something quite amazing. And, you... and that is really wrong. So he's disheartened, mm. but he's heartened by watching Ferrari 1-2, isn't he? he? He is. But what did you get by Wolf saying, you know, uh, this is where we are. We, we, we don't seem to be able to perform at some times and others. Who's the right man to take everybody going forward here? Well, the, the media are really getting stuck into them at the moment because they're saying, what's wrong this time? They mm. know for the last two years that they've got it wrong because this is year three of the new formula. Mm. And they just haven't got it right whatsoever. That That is part of the problem. And the previous technical director has gone. Um, Alison now is in charge. And they still haven't got it right. They will be able to make modifications to the car to make it better. But I do not see them being able to, to challenge Red Bull because whilst Red Bull knew everyone would catch up, Red Bull have made their own step forward. OK, they've got potentially a right reliability problem now because Max said it was like leaving the handbrake on. The brakes were just stuck on, which is why he had the problem in the corner, which is why Sainz got past him. And then it's why his brakes caught fire and off it went. But it just shows that they can be susceptible, that things can go wrong with them. Um, 
But I suspect if when they get to Suzuka, uh, they'll be back on on that scintillating form. Yeah, no, uh, I completely agree with everything you're saying, and uh, <laughs> uh, with that, what? <laughs> Where does everybody go now? I mean, what does Helmo Marco think about this for, for Red Bull? What's, he's been outspoken again, as usual. You know what, I, Mark, I've been watching this whole thing like you, <laughs> and the team's almost imploding. It, yeah. It's absolutely unbelievable because now they're all pointing the finger at Helmut Marco and saying, it's you, <laughs> you're responsible for the leaks, you're the one that wants Christian Horner out, et cetera, et cetera. But then we also find out that it was only very, very recently that a clause has been added to Verstappen's contract that says, if I go, Helmut Marko goes, then Max Verstappen can go. Well, of course, Jos Verstappen loves all of that. And by the way, there's a very good chance that I'll be driving in the same rally as uh, Jos Verstappen in about uh, three weeks' time. So mm. that's going to be because his dad's gone rally driving now. <laughs> And he's coming to UK to drive. So I think the UK press are going to be following him around into the forests of Wales. <laughs> well, it's going to be uh, extraordinary, isn't it? And uh, certainly now, though, at last, looking forward to the next uh, two or three races here, you, you've already mentioned that the track's slightly different uh, 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 the next one. But, you know, we've got what we wanted and needed now again, haven't we? We absolutely have. We absolutely have. And, and I've, got, I've got faith that the other teams like McLaren, who again did a brilliant job, mm. are closing in. Um, they will bring lots of upgrades to lots of different races. And I think whilst Red Bull now are in turmoil internally, and I do know mm. that because Jonathan Wheatley, who's the sporting director of the team, he's literally been doing the job, Christian Horner, for the past two, three months, because there's that much going on internally. Mm. You know, the, the talks apparently between Ferrari and Adrian Newey are advanced. Newey probably has clauses in his contract and so on. So they are literally shooting themselves in both feet. And mm. I think since Dietrich Matasic, the big boss of Red Bull, sadly passed away, that there's been so much infighting. There's been such a big power struggle in there. Yeah. What's going to happen is the team is going to suffer as a result. Whilst Mercedes and McLaren and Ferrari are rubbing their hands together saying, great boy, this is just what we want. Uh, you know, yeah. we'll put them out that way. And Verstappen, 